Okay, folks, we're going to get going. Better sit down and be quiet. We have the head of FIMS up here, and we might pass some regulations if you don't uh, behave yourselves. <laughs> and I get to decide what two we get rid of. So, uh... All right. Of course, now that I say that, I can't find my own paperwork, but... I am uh, thrilled to introduce the new deputy administrator of FIMSA. She's been on the job for what, seven? Since August 7th. Since August 7th. She got there just before the hurricanes hit, just to make her life a little more interesting. Um, Drew Pierce. Um, I'm, I'm just going to turn it over to her. Um, Drew and I have crossed paths briefly. I was just getting on the Hazardous Liquid Technical Committee about the time she was getting off. So we've met each other, but. Uh, I'm glad to run into her again, and I'm glad to see her in this new position. So we're going to hear from the new Deputy Administrator of FIMSA, one of the, the first high-level political appointees. Drew. Thanks. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Carl, and thanks for the invitation to be here. It is my first time at one of the trust's actual meetings, and it's very interesting so far, and I look forward to the rest of the afternoon and also to tomorrow. So thank you very much. Um, your leadership here uh, and your membership on uh, our Safety Centers Advisory Committee, also known as the Liquid LPAC, uh, as well as Sarah's uh, work, is great leadership, um, and we very much appreciate it at FEMSA. It's good to have people who come with a multitude of ideas, but also come with a multitude of understandings of what people are thinking. And this gives him an opportunity, them an opportunity to learn from all of you and us an opportunity too. So that's um, very helpful. I'm delighted to join you here today. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about what we do, but I did only start on August 7th. So this is not going to be a super technical speech. I have the technical folks from FIMSA here. Any of those questions, they can certainly answer. Uh, I can try to field any on the political side, though. Um, as you know, FIMSA's mission is to promote the safe, reliable, and environmentally sound operation of our 2.7 million mile pipeline transportation system as well as the nearly 1 million daily shipments of hazardous materials that travel in our nation by land, by sea, and by air. FEMSA staff, all 536 of us, are committed to protecting people and the environment by safely advancing the transportation of energy and those hazardous materials. We understand that they are essential to all of our daily lives. I'll tell you a little bit about myself because I always think it helps to know a person's background when you are working with them. I'm a farm girl. I grew up on a farm in southern Illinois along the Indiana and Kentucky border, three miles from the Wabash River and just 12 miles from the Ohio River. A railroad runs alongside our family farm and my family was blessed with oil, gas and coal production as well as horses and corn, soybeans, wheat, and a lot of hay for those horses. In 1977, after graduating from Indiana University, I was living and working in Louisville, Kentucky. <coughs> I decided it was time to venture beyond the banks of the Ohio River, and in all honesty, away from the humidity. So I moved to Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, I told my friends and family that I was heading to Alaska for a couple of years. But I fell in love with the state the minute I stepped off the plane, which happened to be at 1 a.m. on a Ju July morning in Fairbanks that was absolute clear blue sky. We could see Denali, uh, not just from the air, but from the land. And from the minute I landed and got on the ground, I knew that it was a place that I was going to adopt as my own. And I've been very lucky because the state also adopted me. My work in Alaska started with banking in Fairbanks, then in Anchorage. That actually took me up to Kotzebue, Alaska, where I lived for almost a year and a half. I was the bank manager in an area the size of Indiana, uh, and uh, a lot less population than Indiana, but certainly the size. 
and uh, north of the, as I said, north of the Arctic Circle. So that was uh, very interesting to understand what sort of transportation systems are important in remote areas, and I'm talking truly remote. Um, I then went uh, finally to Juneau after to work for a session uh, long before running for office. That was at the time over a thousand miles and three time zones away from Kotzebue. So that's how big the state is if you haven't been there. I got my master's degree, actually filed for office while I was at Harvard at school and ran for the Alaska legislature and was elected to the state house. I served two terms there and then four terms in the Senate where I was lucky enough to be in leadership for nine years. I resigned my state Senate seat, I was Rules Committee Chairman, to come to the Department of Interior in 2001. I was then Secretary of Interior Gail Norton's Senior Advisor for Alaska Affairs. But as Carl said, I'm not a complete stranger to FEMSA. After joining the Department of Interior, I served first as the, uh, or not first, but the entire time, as the interior trustee on the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council, and then also on FEMS's Liquids Advisory Committee. It was during this time that I was first confirmed to the position as the federal coordinator for Alaska National Gas Transportation Projects. And I spent, uh, I stayed in that position until 2010. So I've rejoined the ranks of the feds, and as FIMS's new federal or new deputy administrator for the first time, actually since 1977, I've refocused myself so that I'm not totally Alaska centric. Uh, I still fall over once in a while, but I'm um, I'm definitely broadening my horizons. How's that? <clears throat> so. It's time to build relationships in the lower 48 too, and that's one of the reasons I'm here. I want to build relationships with all of you so that I understand your thoughts, your concerns, uh, and have an opportunity to listen to those thoughts and concerns. And I, I really mean the listening part. Um, not just with our government um, partners in the states and the territories and with the tribes, but also with the members of the public uh, from all walks of life who have a shared concern for safety. I'll be listening closely uh, to your perspectives on how together we can achieve better safety outcomes as energy and other hazardous materials are moved around the country. I want to hear your thoughts on ways we can meet our shared safety goals of protecting our communities and the environment from not just pipelines but also from hazardous transportation failures. So we do have a new administrator. His name is Skip Elliott. He was sworn in by the secretary on Monday, so I stepped back from being acting administrator then. Um, Skip is from uh, CSX. He spent his entire career, over 30 years, in the railroad industry. He's originally from northern Indiana, um, and he's had a number of interesting jobs in the railroad industry over the years, but when he retired uh, earlier this year, he was vice president of public safety health and environment with CSX Transportation in Jacksonville, Florida. He's a recognized leader in the railroad industry and throughout the transportation industry in hazardous materials transportation safety, as well as environmental railroad policing. He once upon a time was a railroad police man and homeland security initiatives and policy. So it's great to have him on board. We come with uh, very different backgrounds. Obviously, he's never worked in government. Um, he has the hazmat side. I know more about the pipeline side. And so I think, actually, it's going to be a great partnership, good for FEMSA and good for the nation. So infrastructure is the backbone of our economy. It keeps us moving. It raises the standard of living for America's workers. But our critical infrastructure is aging. It's congested. And it's in need of repair. At FEMSA, we're guided by Secretary Chow's three main priorities. They are maintaining and strengthening safety using sound science and risk-based analysis, rebuilding and refurbishing the critical infrastructure, and creating a regulatory environment that fosters innovation. She's extremely interested in innovation and new technologies. 
And when you meet Secretary Chow or if, when you are, hear her speak anywhere in the country, the first thing she talks about in any speech is safety. That is her focus. It's her focus in the building when she's talking to those of us who work in the building and outside. And she absolutely means it each and every time. Our nation's pipeline system is incredibly safe considering we have a 99.9997% safety record. However, our goal is to get to 100%. And we understand that that's where we need to be. The companies understand that that's where we need to be, and I know that all of you want us to reach that 100%. So we're working today to set standards, not just for today, but working for tomorrow too. You've heard people, including Carl, talk about how long it takes regulations to get through the system. Government seems to get slower, not faster, I can tell you that, uh, from my years working in government. It takes so long to get a reg through, by the time you finally get it through, technology has sometimes not just caught up with you, but gone ahead. So we need to work on ways that we can set standards in the regulations that work today, but also will work tomorrow. <coughs> there are a number of common pipeline issues that we're focused on. Internal corrosion and third-party excavation damage are two of the major threats to pipeline safety. A third is concern regarding the effectiveness of internal assessment technology in the prevention of failures. We know these tools are good and can provide great information about what is occurring on a pipeline, but they're not silver bullets, and over-reliance on any imperfect tool can lead to overconfidence and a potential for problems and failures. PHMSA works to combat these and other issues through a variety of inspection and investigation programs engineering assessments, outreach, training, and research. Another way FEMSA fights a key threat to public environmental safety is via the promotion of 811, the national call before you dig number. 811 encourages people and companies to call before they start an excavation project in their backyard. Whether, <coughs> whether it's a big project trying to build onto a house, whether it's a construction project in the street in front, whether it's the guy digging a hole to put a tree in his, in his yard. Anytime we encourage everyone to use 811, people and companies to call before they start a project in their yards or in the streets. We can therefore help save lives and reduce the potential for environmental damage by minimizing damages to underground utilities and they're not just pipelines that we are trying to protect. We're also trying to protect the electric systems as well as the water systems and these days the fiber optics, optic systems. People get just as upset if their fiber gets cut as they do if their water supply gets cut or their electricity gets cut or their gas line gets cut. It can also cause um, <coughs> perhaps not the same sort of explosions that sometimes unfortunately pipelines can cause but there are other damages. So because damage to pipelines during excavation is a leading cause of serious pipeline incidents in involving either um, fatalities, unfortunately, or injuries, the promotion of 811 is a top priority and it will continue to be. Every nine minutes in the United States, every nine minutes, so at least once since I started talking, someone hits a utility line of some sort because they didn't call 811 every nine minutes. These damages, put it in dollars and cents, mostly dollars, cost the United States over a billion and a half dollars in direct costs, most of which are passed off to consumers. That's all of you. And that figure does not include indirect or induced costs. So every nine minutes, just remember that number. And accidents can occur anywhere. Research, however, proves if someone does call 811 before they dig, they have a 99% chance of there being no incident, no damage, and no one getting hurt. 99% chance. So if you just push that 811, and if you help us push 811, it has a tremendous benefits on the other end. I would ask each and every one of you, and your companies, and your groups, associations, um, make an effort to help us increase both the visibility 
and the reach of the 811 program. Our goal is to make 811 as commonly known as 911. <clears throat> and by the way, I am personally very concerned about the exemptions that we see in states from 811. They're put in place by legislators in most cases or by PUCs. In some states, farmers are exempt. In some states, local governments exempt, are exempt. Um, and who, by the way, does the most construction in a town each year? Uh, the entire Virginia Department of Transportation is exempt, I've discovered. And oh, by the way, and don't tell Skip I said this, but all railroads are exempt. That's too many exemptions. Uh, from my thought. So anything you can do in your home states to work on lowering those preventions, remember nine or one incident every nine minutes. And if you call 811, there's a 99% chance of not having an incident. Those statistics alone, I think, should make everyone a believer in using 811. And frankly, it doesn't take that long. And it stops the incidents. <coughs> so whether it's the farmers, I'm a farmer, whether it's the municipal leaders, you know, you ought to talk to your state legislators and change those statutes. Our first priority is to prevent failures. And the 811 program, as I said, does help reduce entirely preventable releases. The second priority is to minimize as much as, pos as possible the consequences of a failure. One of the ways FEMSA helps to do that is by making data and geographical information systems, or GIS, information available to first responders. We spend uh, quite a bit of money in grants, in fact, tens of millions, uh, to train first responders. And we recognize that that's our responsibility, whether it's on the pipeline side or on the hazmat side. Many of the first responders are volunteer firefighters, and they are out in the more rural areas. And when you think about where are most of the pipelines, and where are most of the most of the rail, and where are most of the interstate miles, <coughs> and other roadway miles, it's out in the more rural areas when you add up. So that's where incidents are happening. So GIS, along with the development and dissemination of pipeline data, enhances regulatory compliance making it easier for industry to comply with pipeline safety regs and for the public and other stakeholders to understand the importance of the role they play in pipeline safety. Every day, new ways to generate and assess data are developed. We've found the um, collection and then the analysis of data to be incredibly beneficial. We use it to continuously improve data quality and uh, analytical capabilities to identify, assess, and manage safety risks. Analyzing data enables us to better understand industry trends <coughs> as well as the impact of our actions, guiding us in determining what is working well and what needs improvement. Blaine, of course, spoke earlier about our use of perform performance metrics and how they can help um, uh, identify emerging safety trends. I'm going to talk a little bit about the R&D that PHMSA does. Uh, it's just part of a huge R&D program, both in the Department of Transportation, but across the federal government. <coughs> Excuse me. Since 2002, FEMSA has funded 270 projects with $109 million from FEMSA and $101 million from resource sharing across a wide range of stakeholders. Our research and development investment brought 27 new technologies to market technologies that are uh, focused on preventing damage, identifying and minimizing leaks, and detecting defects in difficult to inspect pipelines. A couple of examples of our R&D successes. The advancement development of PipeGuard Proactive Pipeline Damage Prevention System project, which is a mouthful, but it improved a sensor system that can provide buried pipelines with protection for up to 30 miles, and also, a free swimming acoustic tool for liquid and natural gas pipeline leak detection project, which developed and leveraged a pre existing free swimming acoustic leak detection tool for use with oil product pipelines, as well as beginning to evaluate it with natural gas pipelines. 
At PHMSA, we are carrying on uh, ongoing regulatory review, as you've heard already today. We are uh, reevaluating uh, some of our current and planned regulations, but we'll continue to work to ensure that our regulations increase safety as well as cost efficiency. We're also moving forward on those current rulemakings. The new Departmental Regulations Steering Committee, which oversees the activities of the entire department, is working with PHMSA as with all the other departments to schedule these rulemakings and to keep moving forward. <coughs> PHMSA is also developing a brand new regulatory, regulatory program as one of these efforts for underground natural gas storage facilities that builds upon the programs a number of states already has in place. In December of 2016, PHMSA issued an interim final rule that set the first minimum federal standards for underground gas storage facilities. It's a new area for us. And we, like many others, are on the sharp edge of the learning curve, understanding the risks to people and the environment and how to best improve safety at these facilities. The extremely large natural gas release at Aliso Canyon two years ago taught everyone some very painful lessons. I'm going to be visiting Aliso Canyon next week to see firsthand uh, what has been done at that facility. I'm familiar with the Alaska Underground Storage Facility, which interestingly enough underlies <coughs> the Kenai National Gas, or the Kenai National Wildlife uh, Refuge. And uh, I, I was at DOI as that was being permitted by the Fish and Wildlife Service. But I haven't visited one of the lower 48 facilities, which frankly are in much more urban areas than the National Wildlife Refuge is. Uh, and also uh, have much more, uh, many more, or a number of more technical aspects at this point. <coughs> we heard your comments <coughs> and your concerns. Um, we're addressing the issues that you were brought up uh, and that we heard in our stakeholder comments. We believe that we allowed sufficient opportunity for all affected stakeholders to provide input to the underground storage IFR. However, we reopened the comment period on October 19th, if you weren't aware of that. So all interested parties have another shot at commenting on its merits and the claims in the petition. That period ends on November 18th. So if you're interested in adding more comments or perhaps commenting the first time on underground storage, please do so. Now is the time. <coughs> We look forward to considering your comments and continuing to work with you as part of the ongoing rulemaking process. As we see with 811, pipeline safety is a shared responsibility between all stakeholders, which means that outreach is an essential component of PHMSA's mission. Raising awareness and communicating with stakeholders is paramount in advancing collective pipeline safety efforts in communities all across the country. Safety is also improved through active and informed stakeholder participation. When we come here to the Pipeline Safety Trust Conference and listen to what you tell us, we all learn. We learn what you think, and that may be improving safety, and what you, we also learn what you think is ineffective, and that's just as important. We might not always agree on everything, and even internally we don't always agree on everything, but it is critical that we, the regulators, stop and listen to what you're telling us. I'll share with you that informed stakeholders are especially valuable in helping us make informed decisions. In 2016, PHMSA established a new Voluntary Information Sharing System Advisory Committee. It will advise the Secretary and PHMSA on the need for and development of an information sharing system to improve pipeline safety. The committee's next public meeting will be on November 29th and 30th in the Washington DC area. That's November 29th and 30th. Dr. Murray is here and will be uh, sharing comments with you later. Uh, she directs our pipeline outreach and engage engagement division. Her team, our community liaisons, interact with the public and other stakeholders, providing consultation on regulatory requirements, encouraging damage prevention initiatives, and they conduct training and other public awareness activities with a wide variety of stakeholders. With a focus on pipeline safety and answering questions at the community level, 
They are, in a way, our ambassadors around the country. Please use them. Use those community liaisons. <coughs> and I want to talk about SMS for a minute because that means talking about changing behavior. And it's a theme at FIMSA. Safety management systems, and Linda will be talking to you um, on the panel tomorrow to discuss the opportunities and challenges of implementing SMS. But at its heart, SMS is about changing behavior and actions to put safety first. It's about doing the right thing when no one is watching, not just the right thing when people are watching. It's a safety culture throughout an organization from the top, and I don't mean just from the CEO, I mean from the board of directors, from the absolute top all the way down to the contractors and the subcontractors, an entire safety culture. <coughs> safety culture is the glue that holds together the different aspects of SMS, like incorporating lessons learned into future actions, or creating a safe environment for people to tell the boss unpleasant and costly news about a pipeline issue. Industry is acknowledging and acknowledges each day the value of SMS in advancing a company's safety culture and their overall performance. FINSA is currently working alongside industry and with them to encourage them to incorporate the principles of safety management systems into their programs to improve safety. Many companies are working to institute SMS and that is not just for the major transportation pipelines, but also within the LDCs. Two that come to mind and two that, I, that I've that i learned um, more about than others so far is Vectron Corporation um, in Indiana, Ohio, and I think they go across into Pennsylvania with both gas and electricity to more than one million customers. They have instituted SMS and they've done it from the top down and from the bottom up and with their contractors. And it, has, uh, it hasn't been cheap, and it takes a while to get everybody into that safety culture, but they are real believers. And Marathon Pipeline, uh, which operates approximately 6,400 miles of underground pipes in 16 states and transports crude oil and petroleum products to and from terminals, refineries, and pipelines, they have also instituted an SMS system. <coughs> it's not just the people in Finley, Ohio. And it's not just the people out in the field, but it's the entire company. And that's what we want to see, and that's what we should all be uh, pushing uh, companies. And I'm not just talking about, by the way, transportation companies. SMS systems are good for all of your companies. You should live that culture, the safety culture, each and every day. And so those, should, those safety systems need to go over to the telephone companies and to uh, <coughs> all of the um, all other companies, whether they're making automobiles or moving oil through a pipeline. So we do stand by our regulations at FIMSA. We're constantly seeking ways to improve them by eliminating unnecessary or overly burdensome requirements that distract from beneficial requirements. We believe the integrity checks, inspections, and training that we currently provide helps us have ever-improving pipeline safety. That's not to say the FIMSA regulated pipelines will never experience failures. I wish that was the case. But I believe our continued safety actions, optimized safety requirements, more effective inspections, improved technology, and stakeholder engagement, all complemented by a learning culture, will steadily improve safety. And we can get to that 100%. So in conclusion, I want to thank you for taking the time to be here. Thank you again for inviting me to be here with you. I know this demonstrates your passion for pipeline safety. And I want to tell you that I'm passionate about pipeline safety too. And those of you from Alaska know the years that I spent putting uh, laws into place up there to help um, ensure that TAPS and other pipelines in Alaska operate safely. <coughs> we at FIMSA believe that protecting the public and the environment are our most important responsibilities. And this conference is the sort of thing that continues to aid in that pursuit. Thank you again for coming, and I just wanna give you um, one tip and one new rule. As you fly home, 
make sure that your electronic devices that have lithium batteries are with you in the passenger cabin, that they aren't down in the luggage. That's the latest hazmat rule. And please remember that PHMSA also does include hazmat, and there's a whole other set of, of regulatory review going on on that side. But that's a conversation for another day. Thanks again for having me here today. Thank you, Drew. Great stuff. We are going to move, let's see here if I can figure it out. We're going to move right on to our breakout sessions. Uh, so in this room, we're going to have uh, communication pipeline risk to public audiences. And downstairs, we're going to have third party excavation damage, uh, which is, as Drew just said, the major cause of deaths and injuries. Um, and before people leave the, the breakout room, I just wanted to say, because it's the last time we're going to be here in this room all together, is that the uh, Pipeline Safety Trust Board of Directors reception is this evening from 5.30 to 7 in the same place where we had lunch today. So see you down there at 5.30. So you can take your uh, choice of those uh, two uh, options, and we'll get started as soon as people get in those rooms. Thank you. Slides for you for fun, you know. I think you're a piece of shit. Pictures of donkeys in there and stuff. Yeah, the second one, I use the second one. Go ahead. Then I'll give you the second one. So, for me, I'm interested in the risk. Yeah. 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 All right, everyone, we're going to get started here. So this is a panel on communicating pipeline risk to public audiences. And my name is Sarah Gossman. I am a professor of law at the University of Arkansas School of Law. I do my research actually on pipeline safety regulation. I'm also vice president of the board of directors of Pipeline Safety Trust. I am really thrilled with this panel and very thankful for our panelists today. So I was asked to give a very brief introduction on the law, so I'm putting on my, um, my law professor hat here 
and I'm going to talk to you about the 2002 statute that begins all of this. So this was um, this requirement that we are going to be talking about today uh, came into effect, uh, well, was passed into law in 2002, and it required operators to carry out a continuing program to educate the public. And then there are a number of topics on which the public is to be educated. Uh, number one, the use of a one-call notification system, possible hazards associated with releases, physical indications that such a release may have occurred, steps that should be taken for public safety when there is a release, and how to report releases. Congress also directed that those activities should advise affected municipalities, school districts, businesses, and residents said that the program should be submitted to FIMSA for interstate pipelines or states for intrastate pipelines and granted authority to FIMSA to set standards and in fact even to develop materials for these programs. In 2005, FIMSA issued rules. They were, these were based on the American Petroleum Institute's recommended practice 1162. That uh, API recommended practice was actually issued in 2003. I know that there's been a second edition since then. That edition was not adopted into rule, and so the rule as it stands has the standard from 2003. In that recommended practice, the audiences are listed in the slide, so they include the affected public, including residents and places of congregation, such as schools and businesses in the vicinity of the pipeline, state and local emergency response and planning officials, local public officials, and excavators. I know that our panelists are going to be talking more specifically about the actual communication, but just briefly, the standard defines baseline and supplemental and enhanced activities, focuses on message, frequency of delivery, mode of delivery, and requires evaluation of those programs. All right, with that. So our panelists today are Dr. Matt Babcock, who's a principal with Wider Lens Research. He is going to be actually talking on a report that he wrote for the Pipeline Safety Trust on risk communication. Then we will have Dr. Christy Murray, Director of Outreach and Engagement from the Office of Pipeline Safety at PHMSA, and then Terry Larson, Principal, Larson Communications and Consulting, and chair of the API RP 1162 task group. And hopefully we will have time also for Carl Weimer to talk. And uh, he's going to talk in his hat as elected member from the county council. And uh, what we've asked the panelists to do is have uh, Dr. Babcock actually uh, talk about the findings from his report. And then we've asked Dr. Murray and Ms. Larson to t talk in response to that report in terms of the issues that Dr. Babcock is raising. Um, so I'm looking forward very much to their presentations and again, appreciate uh, their time with us today. Thank you. So again, hello everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, as was mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the um, uh, some of the findings and some of the kind of history of risk communication um, research um, uh, that I looked into uh, while I was preparing the report. Um, the way I'm going to do that is first to talk a little bit about the challenges and the importance of successful risk communication. Um, a little bit of a motivation of why it's important to kind of look at whatever resources we have available in terms of uh, improving our risk communication. Um, I'm going to then speak about some of the evidence-based design and evaluation of risk communication and those practices that are, that are, um, uh, that are in the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, research. Um, and then I'm going to, oops, sorry. And then I'm going to talk about additional recommendations that come from that research that might apply to the revisions in, in the RP 1162. 
Um, and so to begin, I want to quickly ask everybody to take a second and think, what's the first thing that comes to mind for everybody in terms of risk risks associated with pipelines? Don't answer, just you know, to yourselves for half a second. I know we're a little bit behind time. Um, and then I want to follow up with a question of, if anybody could raise their hands, who thinks that everybody here thought the same thing? OK, good. All right, so, so right, perceptions of risks and the context in which risks are understood and communicated differ. This is a common, common idea. This, is not, this was not a common idea in the original kind of analysis of risk back in the 60s. People thought that there was, you did a calculation, you got two different you know, expected outcomes, you compared those two outcomes, whichever one was worse, you went with the other one, and that was it. One audience, one idea, one communication. Um, we know that's not, that's not how it works. We know that, that people have different perceptions of risks. We know that some people concentrate on, on the data, on the, you know, this is from um, uh, the work uh, um, from um, Paul uh, Parlamac. Sorry, it's a little small. Um, and it just kind of taking some FIMS data and showing here's the kind of trend line in terms of the data. Um, there's other people that kind of think in terms of not just the expected outcome and the probability and the hazard, but the, out, the, the effect on people. The effect, this is uh, some photos from the San Bruno explosion in, in 2010. Um, and the idea is, as I think we all know, that people perceive these risks differently, people think automatically of, of risks differently, and how these, whether or not they, and, and how these pieces of information fit into their con overall context is going to be different. Um, this is exacerbated by the fact that we work in these complex systems. We work in complex, so pipelines in the United States, pipeline infrastructure is a complex system, um, much like the electricity sector, much like the water system. It's a, it's a social techno technological system that incorporates both physical reality and human perceptions of that reality. And with these complex systems, you have more and more groups that are involved. This is um, taken from FIMS's website, uh, where you have uh, a listing of some of the different key actors that are involved in uh, pipeline safety, um, <coughs> along with the idea that, that public perception and public awareness of pipelines and pipeline risks are important for the overall um, continued safe operation of those pipelines. And the, the important part here is that you have more complex systems, you have more actors, and more of those actors are, are further separated by their perceptions. You have, with a more complex system, the experts, the physical experts on a system, the mechanical engineers or the, the pipeline engineers, are, are, have a very different set of knowledge and, and understanding of the overall uh, system than do different parts of the public. The emergency managers have their own context in which pipelines is just one of many threats that they have to, they have to prepare for and deal with. And so, and additionally, um, risk communication can have different goals. You can have, um, uh, this is a, a kind of a categorization that Lundring and McMahon have come up with, um, where they separate risk communications into crisis communications, care communications, and consensus communications. Crisis being in the, in the midst of an earthquake, in the midst of an emergency. How do you, uh, what kinds of communications um, do you, do you uh, strive to, to put forth? And how those and what's the goal of those, communi of those communications? And the goals in crisis is you have to get somebody to do something. You have to get them to evacuate. You need to, not to think, but to just kind of do. Um, that's different than some other kinds of risk communications, where your care communications is where you're trying to um, uh, provide information for informed decision making in the context in which most people agree on what the risks are and what the what the um, what to do about those risks. An example is the idea of the 811 line, uh, the call one call line, that. The idea that very, very few people, if any, would actually like to hit a pipeline by accident. Um, there's a kind of a generalized idea that that uh, there's an agreement that hitting those pipelines um, is 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 problematic, um, and an agreement that that um, people should try to not do that. Um, consensus communication, and I think this is kind of where where some of the broader ideas of risk communication in pipelines come in, is the idea that that um, there's less agreement on the risks. Or there's less agreement on what to do about them. That you have um, people's different. There's the different values that come into play. There's different. There's the different contexts. And so things like um, that are that are in the regulations, as we mentioned, the idea that you that you um, advise communities about uh, the benefits and the risks associated with pipelines to inform planning decisions, to inform right of way decisions, to inform these decisions that involve both a mix of physical kind of risks and people's values over what, what should be done and, how to and who should be exposed to those risks. Um, and so 
again, there's kind of this range of different types of communication goals from just inducing action to informing longer term decision making. And one of the ideas is that all these um, goals, uh, no matter what goal, it's, it's also important to understand that you have these different groups and you have these different perceptions. Um, another wrinkle to add to this is we have a complex system. We have many, many people that are working in within, that have to work with each other but have, are coming from different contexts, is that we tend to assume, and it's kind of a, a robust finding in the psychological, psychological literature, that we tend to assume that we're better at communicating than we are. Um, this is true at a personal level. This is true at a group level. Um, and why is that? So there's, there's again, kind of a, a whole branch of psychology that talks about um, decision making and the effects of decision making uh, and the effects of um, and our overconfidence in our decision making, our overconfidence in our communication about things. Um, one idea is that we have a, there's called the common knowledge effect where we just assume that other people have the same understanding of the situation as us. That when I tell you something, it's, you know, it's to impart a certain piece of additional information, but in general, we all agree on what the, the kind of, uh, uh, situation is, and um, uh, and I might not tell you information because I think you already know it, because I know it. My experience tells me that I that I uh, that I need to know this for this for this decision about pipeline safety or whatever type of decision, and uh, therefore you probably know it. It's kind of an assumption that we we ha we have. Another one is this false consensus effect, where um, we assume that peop that if everybody has the same information, they will make the same decision. Um, this again comes into the idea that, that we tend to overestimate how sometimes how alike other people are to our own experiences. Um, and uh, as kind of we, we mentioned and was mentioned earlier today, there are very different um, types of experiences that people go through in different contexts. Um, the problem with the false consensus effect, effect is that you assume, you tend to assume other people's values, um, which can get into, um, uh, which can lead to to, to poor risk communication because you're not actually communicating about something that some about the thing that somebody cares about. Um, there's a, a whole slew of other kind of biases and myths within the literature um, that kind of again get back to this idea that we're overconfident in how we talk and how we communicate um, information, especially about kind of risks. Um, and so, with these challenges um, that we have different individual contexts, we have increased complexity of the system, which means more stakeholder groups and more interaction between them. Um, the potential confusion of what the goals are um, and the tendency to use faulty intuition um, leads to, can lead to over-assuming your audiences, which leads to inefficient strategies, misinformed or underinformed audiences, um, or at the worst side of things, mistrust, acrimony, and breakdown in communication. This was talked about earlier today, the sense that, um, that part of the risk communication um, kind of mandate has been, has been to not just provide information, but also to create these relationships because we know that we're going to have to keep on working with each other in the future. Um, and so how to do this. Um, so, so this can be hard in any sense, in any kind of social technological system where you have different experts and you have different kind of opinions. Um, it can be additionally hard um, uh, when the pipes are underground and, and not a lot of people see them. Um, and so um, there's, a, there's an idea that you need more evidence-based strategies in order to um, help uh, gain evidence in lieu of assuming um, uh, things about your audience and about what the decisions that they face are. Um, this is kind of a kind of a real quick version of the history um, associated with uh, risk communications. Again, the idea that originally there was this idea that you you just you're doing a calculation. The numbers tell everything. You just got to share the numbers. Make the do the do the calculation. Share the numbers. Um, assuming that everybody agrees on what the problem is and what the solutions are. Um, then that's you know, gradually expanded to the idea that, no, you have to know your audiences. There's not just one audience. There's different audiences, and there's different groups. Um, though at the same time that this still, again, because of our biases, can lead us to assume things about those audiences. We can say, oh, yeah, we have these different public groups that we have to talk to, but we're still making a lot of assumptions about what they need and what, what, um, what they want to get out of our, our interaction. Um, uh, to expand it further is to, to actually kind of listen to work with and know your audiences at a, at a, with more evidence, with more of an idea of this is actually what they um, believe and what they what, and the kinds of ideas that they have, and not and about safety, about whatever parts of the system, um, without making more assumptions that lead to kind of inefficient communications. Um, so 
there's a again kind of there's a history of this. Um, there's you know uh, in the 70s was some of the research that that started talking about the fact that people have different perceptions and, and put different emphasis on different parts of risks, whether it's uncertain, whether it's indi indicative of something greater than the media problem, um, in addition to the actual physical numbers. Um, and uh, and so, so there's been a, a kind of, again, this history of, of literature, and there's also been kind of attempt, attempts more recently to kind of take that and turn it into guidance for, regulate, for regulate, regulating and, uh, agencies and for other kind of groups. Um, this is uh, on the left hand, on your left hand side, is the Communicating Risks and Benefits Guide from the FDA, which incorporates a lot of kind of the kind of up to date um, and historical information about uh, uh, risk communications and risk communications within a context in which you, again, you have this difference between the experts and the folks on the ground that are actually being impacted by the decisions. Um, and so, what this, uh, a lot of this evidence points to is, again, we're trying to increase evidence, increase our audience-focused design. Um, and one of the ways that, they, that this, these, this research breaks us down is to, to and suggests a, kind of a method to do this, is to follow um, this idea that you analyze what people need to know from a more technical standpoint or from a more kind of general standpoint. You assess what they currently believe. Um, and that's the important part that, that gets missed a lot is that even if people are uh, believing the quote unquote wrong thing, they're believing something that's physically impossible, um, that, you know, uh, that um, nuclear radiation can travel through an electric line, you know, miles away, kind of like, um, there's a, again, in the literature there's a group, there's, there's a number of different studies on, on what people believe that's actually, it's not physically possible. That's still important to know. Um, and part of the reason that's still important to know is because that's still within, that's still part of their context when they're taking in other information. Um, so the idea is to analyze what could be useful for them, um, and part of the part of the idea is what they need to know is not just what you think they need to know, but it's also what uh, it's not only what they need to know to do what you want them to do, but it's also what they need to know in order to follow and make informed decisions based upon their own values. Um, and the idea, the key part of this is to compare those two, to get a sense of what what information do we think uh, people. Um, should have and use, and what do they currently believe, and what are the differences? And to kind of give an example of this, there's a couple of different ways of doing this. One of the, um, oops, yep, one of the kind of uh, ways of doing this is is called the mental models approach to risk and a risk communication, where you use a uh, expert panels and you use a mix of, um, uh, sorry, use a mix of both expert panels and uh, literature review and some interviews to construct what's called, quote unquote, the expert model, um, which has, you know, kind of the mental map in people's heads about what the drivers are, what their perceptions are, what, their what the decisions they can make and what decisions they want to make, uh, and what the outcomes of those things are, of those, of those interactions are. Um, then you can perform, um, similarly, uh, kind of open-ended interviews uh, to get uh, a kind of a layperson's perspective Either the audience, in some cases, in which, in which, uh, in some cases, that might be a public audience that is less um, expert in the, in in the um, technical details. It could also be another expert, in the sense that again, pipeline operators are expert in their own field, emergency managers are expert in their own field, homeowners are expert in their own kind of field, being their their you know decisions on whether or not to own a home near pipelines, those kind of things. Um, and the idea, again, is to can kind of compare these mental maps, um, both uh, to find where the gaps are and where, where, information, where, where surprises are. Um, <coughs> and to follow up this up with, with kind of surveys and kind of get more statistical, to have more of a, a better statistical picture of, um, of whether or not some of these ideas are just kind of random ideas or whether or not these are, these are in the, within the, the broader group. Um, and, and, sorry, and then, so, uh, using this to compare these two, these two uh, kind of models can help you, again, locate where you need to, to improve communications and also an idea of how to do that. Um, and so, uh, and that's on that kind of design side. So how, how do we help design communications in a way that kind of, again, uses more evidence of what people actually experience as opposed to kind of assuming what they experience. Um, on the other side uh, is the idea of, 
of using more evidence to evaluate those communications. And so uh, some of the literature in the FDA guidelines and, and earlier literature, um, there's this idea that we need to have requirements for what successful risk communication actually means. Um, in this case, the idea is that communication contains the information needed to, for effective decision making, makes sense, communication connects users to that information, and that the communication is understood by users. And a lot of times the, the simple kind of way that people go about doing this is they make sure that that number two is taken care of, that we have people connected, that people are talking to it, which is an important integ integral part, but it's not the only part of the, the picture in terms of what defines successful risk communication. Um, there's, again, many ways of doing this. Um, uh, this is kind of a list of some of the different uh, strategies, ranging from less expensive uh, to more expensive, potentially, but also ranging from less actual evidence to more evidence. Um, you can think about different kinds of uh, uh, kind of social science strategies, focus groups versus surveys versus kind of experiments, um, and why um, uh, it's. It's, it's always good to do some sort of evaluation, again, because we tend to assume that we're doing good, um, even when we're not. Um, uh, but that there, are, there are ways of doing this evaluation that, that are uh, improvements over um, others. Um, and so, again, kind of from the, the research guidance, and I'm going through this quickly, but uh, you know, there's this idea that evidence-based um, design should happen and evidence-based evaluation. Um, this includes and requires more interaction with audiences. If you're going to have to start with what people need to know within their own context, you have to interact with those people, you have to talk to those people. Um, and again, this might use more resources up front. It might um, uh, require different types of work um, than what um, uh, some communicators have tried to do, um, but the end result should be a more efficient and effective and hopefully more trustworthy process where you know you can spend a lot of time if you start with assumptions about your 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 target audience and go through a communication strategy and then try to uh, improve that later on that usually um, is going to be a less efficient process than starting off the bat with this idea of, of concentrating on what the audience needs in the first place um, so to take some of that and and turn into kind of to talk about the the recommended practice um, these are kind of broader kind of initial recommendations based upon some of the kind of broad ideas from, from the current literature and from kind of the, the history of the risk communication literature. Um, first that, that uh, and this has been talked about earlier today a lot, the idea of, of kind of involving more um, uh, experts and, and public stakeholders in the development of future guidance. And part of this goes back to the first part of my talk where you have more complex systems, you're going to have, you're going to have kind of by default larger gaps in understanding. And the idea is to, to close those, try to close those as soon as you, as soon as you can, uh, because it's, it, makes it, more, it makes it easier to, to, do, to, to create communications and to find out what people actually need on both sides, rather than starting at a later point. Um, uh, from the goals, there, uh, be, between the regulations and the uh, mix of, uh, 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 and the regu sorry, the regulations and the recommended practice, there's a mix of kind of what the goals are in terms of do we want to get just get people to do one thing? Uh, in some cases, that's true, right? We want to get people to get call 811. Um, in other cases, it's more we want to provide them information to make longer term decisions. And when you have guidance that, that might kind of, that talks about both at the same time without differentiating, it can, it can uh, lead to, again, kind of, uh, um, I guess, a, an inefficient way of, 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 of going about, or potentially an effective way of, of kind of developing a strategy. Um, for the designs of risk communications, and this is the last slide, so I don't have time, but um, uh, one of the ideas is that, that um, is to in increasingly emphasize, and, and in the current recommended practice, a lot of these ideas are talked about. Um, the idea is to emphasize some of the parts that people tend not to emphasize. Again, we kind of, our default um, uh, is to assume that, that we've done a good job. Our default is also to kind of assume that people are going to act the same way that we do. Um, and so emphasizing the fact that that's not true and that you really need to understand the audience as a first step, um, uh, I think is helpful in, in kind of making the process more efficient. So, similar, so this is a diagram from, uh, I think, the second edition. It's a, a replication of the diagram from the first um, edition of the recommended practice, except it, it cuts off part of the top part. Um, but 
uh, what's what in in the recommended practice, you know, there's this idea between enhanced and supplemental, uh, enhanced and, and baseline practices. But the idea, and in in the recommended practice, it does a, a job of a good job of talking about the fact that you know enhanced based is based upon the context in which your audiences are, which is important. Um, the way the process flow diagram is, and the way it's talked about in the recommended practice, it comes later on in the, pr in the process. Um, and so one potential recommendation is to try to get the idea that, that the decision whether or not to do enhanced um, kind of uh, strategies should come earlier. It should come in, the, in part, of the, part of the process when you're actually figuring out who your audience is and why they may be um, uh, thinking about their context a little bit differently than you are. Um, in terms of evaluation of risk communications, um, Again, the idea is uh, one of the one of the recommendations is to emphasize not just step two, which is making sure people are connected, but also emphasizing the fact that step one, making sure that people have the information they need, and step three, that they understand it, um, uh, are helpful in, in determining whether or not the, the communication that you're spending lots of money and lots of resources to do um, are actually effective. So thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Christy Murray, and I am the director of our, our outreach and engagement in the Office of Pipeline Safety. Um, one, I want to thank Dr. Babcock for his um, evaluation of risk communication and report that he issued. What I found in reading his report and just reflecting on risk communication is, one, a lot of things that we currently do really fit into the discussion that he raised. And also, a lot of what we do, um, specifically at FEMSA, really speaks to communication. Um, in my particular division, we actually do a lot with damage prevention. Um, we do a lot of externally outreach um, work where we work with a variety of different stakeholders and different audience groups. And we spend a lot of time talking and listening and really wanting to understand some of the issues, some of the gaps in communication, awareness, and understanding, so this conversation certainly complements a lot of the work that we engage in every day. Between our damage prevention efforts, our national pipeline mapping system work and products we put out, a lot of work we do with the emergency response community in terms of outreach, um, our efforts to promote the Pipeline and Inform Planning Alliance, recommended practice, our community liaison, formerly known as the CATS program, um, we work a lot with different communities sharing information around technical assistance and other pipeline safety questions. The grant programs that we oversee in my division, and of course public awareness, they're very complementary to some of the aspects that were raised in the, in the report. In terms of pipeline uh, public awareness, um, as it's been talked about several times, we've talked about RP 1162, um, Sarah did a good job of giving an overview of how 1162 fits into our federal regulations. We incorporate the first edition currently into our federal regulations. And what I wanted to depict here was just kind of a flow of, you have your RP, which, was, which is an industry standard with American Petroleum Institute. Um, it's incorporated, the first edition in our federal regulations and the liquids regulations and gas. And then from there, operators are developing programs, they're implementing their programs, they're reaching out to the four affected stakeholder groups that have been mentioned. They're also looking at their outreach messages, content, finding out what's working, what's not, making adjustments, evaluating their programs for effectiveness. Um, the regulators, state and federal, are going out. We, from 2010, I would say roughly to 2014 or so, we went out and took targeted looks at public awareness across um, the nation and looked at pipeline operators' programs to gauge how effective their programs were. And using that um, ultimately as an opportunity in that yellow section to learn. How do we understand what's working, understand what opportunities there still are collectively as an industry, regulators, the affected stakeholders combined. One of the key initiatives that we undertook starting back in 2013, we um, formulated a public awareness working group to take a look at 
our inspection results, um, some of the best practices and feedback we've gotten from industry, input from our affected stakeholder groups and others, to really um, talk about what are the areas that are really working well with public awareness, what are the things that we're still struggling with that we recognize there's still opportunities for improvement. So what we did is that group, we assembled a group, took us roughly three years, and um, last year in May we actually published a joint public awareness SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats report. And again, that report was really just about sharing different perspectives, perceptions on what's working, what's not working so well, and how do we move forward with public awareness from a regulatory standpoint, from an operator standpoint who's really, you know, collectively working to try to improve our communications, and even beyond. And but like the SWOT analysis report, there were a number of findings. Um, you can find that report online, and there's a link at the um, end of my presentation. But some of the findings from the SWOT report really align well with what was presented in the evidence-based report. Um, one of the areas that um, stuck out was the balance. There's, a, there's some struggles with balancing between how much information do we push out versus um, is it really reaching the intended audience? Is, is it too much information? And are we losing our audience because we have so many competing messages being thrown at um, individuals? Also, um, there was a recognition that there's been difficulty in measuring effectiveness, uh, program effectiveness, behavioral change. One of the um, comments that we hear quite a bit is we can lead the horse to water, but we can't make them drink. There's no obligation from emergency responders or the general public to actually um, take in the information, um, decide that it's worth taking a different action, or even deciding if it's something that they want to ask more questions about to become more informed to make um, more effective decisions. So that was there was a we consider that a thread area. So we can push out a bunch of information, but how do we how do we gauge if it's really affecting behavioral change? And that's something that we'll continue to talk about moving forward. Also, there was a sentiment that there was, you know, a, a, we have to strike a balance between consolidated versus operator-specific messages. And then it says gaps, but it really should be gaps. But there are also gaps in, in what's communicated with pipeline systems, meaning 1162 today really focuses on um, normal operations of pipelines. But what happens when a new system is brought on online? Is there an initial communication that communicates the um, more appropriate or uh, timely risk, inherent risk, that may be um, important in different communities as things come on online? What happens if an operator decides that they want to reverse a line or um, abandon a line? How does um, those different changes in pipeline systems, how are those accounted for in public awareness and in our federal regulations? Those are areas that we're definitely going to be considering moving forward. FEMS has been involved with public awareness. I've been with FEMSA for 10 years, and I know we've been, public education is a, a cornerstone of what we, we've done for forever, for quite a while within our agency. But as we're moving forward, we have the SWOT analysis report, we have other pieces of input that will advise what we do. FEMS is certainly going to be taking a look at our internal processes, taking a look at our current policies, um, identifying the things that are, are relevant for us to focus on from the SWOT analysis report and other um, data sources so that we can understand how can we continue to drive improvement and even what we do related to risk communication, public awareness, pipeline safety, all of those. One of the things we're doing, we're planning to participate on API's RP 1162 rewrite task force. Um, there's a number of my staff who are participating um, either on the task force itself or in the reading room. We, we're not participating as voting members, but we are participating in a fashion so that we can um, provide any consultation or information that we, we have to help um, improve the processes. We're also looking, I think collectively, the whole API task force, but certainly um, I'll speak to FEMSA, we're definitely looking to align with safety management systems. Stakeholder engagement, I think it aligns very well with what we're doing with public awareness. Management of change, I just talked a minute ago about the different changes in pipeline systems. How does that factor into the communications? And of course, building in, looking to build in, plan, do, check, act, that whole cycle into public awareness as we're moving forward. 
And then there's a host, and this is just a, a few that I've um, highlighted here, of other communication initiatives that we get involved in within our agency. But one thing that I will say about the many different communication initiatives is we recognize we can't and we should not do it alone. So most of what we do, we're actively um, seeking out diverse perspectives, whether it's different stakeholder groups, working with industry and others, sometimes expanding beyond the normal audiences that we've traditionally worked with. And we're constantly looking for who are we missing? Who should we, re we be reaching out to that we may not be thinking about as we're um, looking at our policy and really wanting to uh, raise more awareness with our outreach efforts. So Dr. Babcock talked a lot about risk communication. So I started to think about that more and look at his report and do a little bit of digging and try to really put it back into perspective with what we do with pipeline safety. And three things stuck out to me with, um, with one of the points he made. It's more than just sharing information. So I thought, you know, one of the things that we're responsible for we have an obligation to inform different audiences, the public, about pipeline safety and potential hazards and general actions they can take to remain safe. Then we have an opportunity to engage, encourage dialogue between, I say the sender and receiver when you think in terms of a communication message, but keeping that open opportunity like forums like this, public meetings and many other settings to really have some rich conversations around pipeline safety and maybe um, looking for other opportunities and different ways that we can move forward. And then there's also that opportunity to uh, be more inclusive, involve uh, stakeholders and participants, whether it's regulators, industry, affected communities, and so forth. But usually you hear people talk about communications in terms of a two-way street, but I say that it's more of a multi-way um, communication because it's not just one or two individuals. It's a very, as, as Dr. Babcock mentioned, a complex system Complex, complex needs in terms of different perceptions that different um, individuals and groups bring to the table. So here's just a quick example of perspectives. The more we work with external stakeholders, the more you recognize that you can look at the same thing and see it from different perspectives. And it just really highlights to me, and I've used, used this before, that you can look at the same thing, but you have to be open and objective enough to maybe consider that um, you maybe need to walk around that same um, situation to look at it from a different perspective. Another interesting point that was raised, that there are varying perceptions and information sharing needs. So one of the things that I think we're struggling with as an industry is how much information do we share? Who needs what and when? I see public awareness in terms of the recommended practice as really being the minimum standard with some enhancements in terms of how we communicate as an overall industry. But then there are situations where it needs to be more operator specific, more incident specific, more location specific. Those specifics need to be accounted for. So whether you start at the left end of the spectrum, general awareness is really the 811 messaging, more those national messages that all of us have in common. And then it could grow. So as those, the spectrum of different stakeholders and their interest and their needs and information grows, so must our ability to engage with those various stakeholder groups. And so you also increase the amount of information sharing that you um, would build into your strategic efforts. Again here, striking a balance, two perspectives. When do we collaborate and have more national pipeline safety messages? When do operators provide specifics about their system that are relevant to particular communities? That's one. And then the other is, what's, what's not enough information? How do you know if you're giving just um, uh, the right amount of information versus is really too much information? And so those are some of the challenges that we'll continue to talk about as we move forward with public awareness. And also, um, I just want to highlight, there's already been mentioned about our uh, community liaison program. I just want to raise the awareness that this is a group that's really externally focused. There are resources. We have two um, community liaisons in each region, and they're here to help answer pipeline-related questions about many topics. And I don't have a lot of time to get into these, but what we do every six months is have our community liaisons consolidate. What are you getting a lot of questions about? And these are the top eight areas that we get questions about. Um, some questions are silly as, hey, I see that there's a pipeline marker in my community. I don't like how it looks. Can I pick another one out? To more um, substantial questions related to new pipeline. Hey, I hear there's a new pipeline in my community. Who has jurisdiction over it? 
So we get a, a, a diverse group of um, different type of questions that we're um, happy to work with stakeholders on. I don't have a lot of time to get into it, but just for general awareness, we do have grant programs, one of which that may be of interest to this group is our technical assistant grant program. This is yet another opportunity to help engage with various stakeholders, um, to look at risk communications and raise awareness. There's a uh, link to this if you want more information that um, we'll be happy to share. Also, we've talked about public meetings that are coming up. Um, I'm not gonna touch on those since most have already been talked about previously. But I will say in conclusion, that risk communication, you don't arrive at it. As risks change, so much your ability to communicate differently with different people, different ways, technology changes, so that it affords us different opportunities to leverage technologies, but also that comes with um, bringing, along, bringing along certain challenges that technologies may present. Um, certainly, is, it is important to continue to involve affected stakeholders throughout the process and what we're doing. And recommend, recommendations, recommended practices and regulations are just two mechanisms that we use to communicate, but they're not the only one. So we want to continue to encourage dialogue, such as this forum and other um, activities to look forward to those opportunities to talk about risks. And thank you very much. Um, and sorry, I just have to do a really quick plug. Go Astros, the orange and the blue. <laughs> just saying. It was a late night in the bar, but it was a good night in the bar. So, you know. Um, I'm not sure there's ever a bad night in the bar, but that's another story. All right, uh, Terry Larson. Um, I am formerly with Enbridge, and um, as of this spring, um, started my own uh, communications consultancy. Uh, and uh, as was mentioned, I'm chairing the, um, uh, the group that is revising 1162 uh, for the third edition. Um, and so when, when we had the conversation about the risk report and um, you know, its response and, and putting that in context of what we're doing from an industry point of view, we thought this might be um, an interesting uh, part of that discussion. Um, would also like to thank Dr. Babcock for the report and Christy, um, a lot of good information as always um, from your end. All right, so what I wanted to start with um, oops, is just a quick look at what 1162 is and what it's not. Um, it provides a lot of good guidance um, for pipeline operators that uh, have to uh, develop, want to develop and implement uh, pipeline public awareness programs. We want people who live and work and congregate near our pipelines to understand what that means. Um, both in terms of safety of the assets, because obviously we, we want to we keep product in the pipeline. You never want product to come outside of the pipeline until it's supposed to do that. Um, but that means a real emphasis on protecting people and protecting communities and, that is a, and the environment. And that's a huge priority for every pipeline operator. Um, and uh, uh, so what we get with 1162 is some good guidance on how to do that. Keep in mind, um, as Sarah mentioned earlier, the first edition was published in 2003, became effective in uh, June of 2006. So we're 14 years down the road from the first edition, uh, the, uh, the actual publication date of the first edition. A lot has changed since then. Um, it provides a process for program evaluation um, and some suggestions on, on how to um, meet the measures that are included in 1162. Um, you know, did we reach the people we needed to reach? Did they understand the message um, that we needed to give them? Um, did they change any behaviors? You know, did they call 811? Did they call their local one call center if they're not prior to the 811 number? Um, you know, did they take some of those actions? And then what did that mean for the company? Did any of the company's bottom line results um, change as a result of that? Um, and then provides a framework to help operators comply with regulatory requirements. I mean, and that is a, a very real bottom line for us. This is a regulatory requirement. 
it's a great thing to do, and we and we're doing it because we want to do it. But we're also doing it because it's a it's a uh, there are regulatory requirements around all of this. It is not a one-stop shop for every communication and engagement need that exists because there are pipelines in the ground. And it will never be a one-stop shop for all communication and engagement needs that exist because pipelines are in the ground. That's, that is, I mean, that's, it's very, it's that simple. There are other regulations for pipeline siting, um, whether it's gas or oil. Um, there are other uh, regulations and standards for communicating around pipeline construction. Um, that doesn't mean that some of that may not be on the table as we go through this process, but there are other um, regula regulations, there are other standards, th standards that all already um, outline what those communications and engagement opportunities and needs are. Um, and so, again, I mean, it's, it's just 1162 is what it is. It's around um, awareness and engaging and educating and informing, um, but it's never going to meet all of those needs um, across the board. It's also not perfect. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we're 14 years down the road from the first, first publication date of the first edition. Um, a lot of information needs have changed in that, those 14 years. Hell, social media didn't even exist in 2003. Um, barely was starting to exist in 2006 when the regulation took effect. Um, and, the, uh, and we all had to have those programs in place and running. Um, so channels continue to involve, information needs continue to involve. And as that happens, um, there are imperfections, right? And there will always be some imperfections. All right, so when we look at the, uh, the risk report, there's a lot of really good information in the risk report. Um, it was actually, it was really good reading. As a communications professional, it was good reading. Um, there are, there's a list of things that we agree on. Uh, clear, concise, useful information. We all appreciate that. Right? I don't think any, anyone really appreciates having to um, muddle their way through a bunch of unnecessary information to get to the point. Um, <coughs> excuse me, there's a lot of coughing going on at this podium today. Um, as Christy mentioned, uh, risk, re risk communication requires more than just sharing information. We agree with that. Um, it's important to understand what your, what your audience needs to know and to know or to understand, trying to understand what they already know or what they already believe. Again, we agree with that. Face-to-face, um, -face, two-way, audience-centric, whatever you want to call it, communications, always going to be way more effective than a one-way communication channel. As a communications professional, like, you know, the, anytime you can have a face-to-face -face conversation or even a phone call, person-to-person, -person, you're always going to come out much better in the long run than, than just giving someone some information and not really giving them an opportunity to have feedback and, and, um, and really engage in that conversation, that dialogue. We agree, better engagement is needed. I don't think there's any pipeline operator that really disagrees with that. Um, the nitty gritty details of what that actually means is where you know, there's a lot of room for conversation. Uh, and we agree that communication products should be tested, just like our program should be tested and evaluated, and all that should change as it needs to change, based on what we learn from those evaluations. Um, one of the realities of the report, and it's been it's been mentioned, um, it's I mean it's essentially it's a literature review, um, and so as it is, um, as as the report stands now, there are some things that uh, don't fully represent what operators actually do. Uh, just by the, just the reality, the nature of how the, uh, the research was conducted and how the report was put together. Um, there is actually quite a bit more on testing and effectiveness measurement that operators do than what's reflected in the report. Um, and we're using um, professional researchers and scientists to do those measurements. Um, it's, not, uh, you know, it's not pipeline operators doing it ourselves. We're actually using people who are trained and, know, and do know what they're doing. So when we're looking at materials, for example, that's where we're using focus groups. Um, focus groups, generally speaking, can't be used um, in a broad ranging way because they're not repeatable, typically. Um, and so we're not using them in that way. We're using them to test materials and the effectiveness of materials with specific audience groups. Um, online research boards, in-depth interviews, where we actually get good information that then allows us to change those materials as they need to be changed so that they can be more effective with our audience groups. 
Again, though, we're not perfect, and the materials still have, in general, a long way to go. So if you look at the first edition of 1162, I think there are 13 baseline messages that we're required to provide. Generally speaking, from I mean, communications theory, three, maybe five messages, and you have to repeat that five to seven times before anybody actually really recalls and remembers that information. So, you know, the second edition, sorry, the second edition got that, tend to talk with my hands, um, got that number of baseline messages down to five. That was a tremendous improvement. Um, we still need the repetition. So um, there's still improvement to be made, but we get there through the testing and the effectiveness measurement processes that we're already going through. Um, annual implementation review. So this is where operators look internally. They're doing internal interviews. They're doing, you know, working with internal compliance and audit groups to understand are we doing what we said we were going to do? Are we doing it in a way that's effective? Um, and, uh, and then the actual effectiveness evaluations. Surveys um, is a big part of this, especially for larger operators, because we've got really very broad audiences um, that we're dealing with. For, I'll give an example with Enbridge. Um, when I ran that program, we were looking at audiences in 17, 18 states. That, you know, without some sort of a survey instrument, that's very difficult to get the information you need in order to really look at the effectiveness of your program. Um, but it's, you know, those are national surveys, they're regional surveys, they're collaborative surveys, they're audience specific, they're brochure surveys. There's a number of different ways that that information is being collected under that heading of survey. Um, one on one conversations, in depth research conversations. Um, other in-person activities are also happening to help us test the effectiveness of, those, of our programs. Um, so there's, there's, it's, it's quite a bit deeper um, when we look at the overall effectiveness measurement process that most operators are using than what's actually indicated in this report. Um, and then our findings do change our programs. They do change our materials. Um, there's a reason why we continue to, to do those evaluations, and it's so that we can get better and we can improve what we're doing and how we're communicating with our, um, with our key audience groups. Because um, again, yes, we're making assumptions on information that they need, but there's information that we need them to know about pipelines and pipelines in their communities and facilities that they may be near. Um, supplemental and or enhanced programs, depending on whichever version um, you're actually using, um, that really is, and yes, it does come late in the process, um, but it comes late in the process for a reason, and that is because we need that time to really understand where we have additional data, additional circumstances that are occurring along our systems, which, which we don't always know about at the beginning of the communication process. Um, but that's our opportunity for, for two-way and for face-to-face -face, uh, communication and engagement. Um, and there's a list, there's a whole list of things that might um, occur that would dictate when we need to do some of those communications that we wouldn't otherwise um, maybe know about earlier. All right. Um, so really quickly, um, I just wanted to take some time and, and give you an update on the third edition and the review process that's in place. So we do have the task team that's created, as Christy mentioned, um, and we have started work. So we had a kickoff call in uh, July, late July, and then we had our first face-to-face -face meeting, as Dave Merck mentioned earlier, um, last week in D.C. There's a, as you can see from the list there, there's a, a good number of people that are engaged in that revision process. Um, there are pipeline operators, a number of, uh, we've got the alphabet soup of trade associations, um, public representatives, Pipeline Safety Trust, Pipeline Safety Coalition. We've got representation from three groups of emergency response officials. Um, public officials are uh, represented. We have consultants and vendors with a lot of experience and knowledge and expertise in the room as well. Um, and then our regulators, FEMSA and then also NAPSER um, at the state level. Uh, between now and the end of the year, we're hoping to get a conference call together to sort of work through um, organization, defining team structure, how we're actually going to work, and then we'll, we'll really start work um, in January on, um, on that document. Uh, and it, it is a consensus process, which is one of the things that I wanted to highlight. So, it, you know, it's, the reality is with that many people in different groups, um, we're not all going to agree on everything, and that's okay because it's a consensus process. Um, and last slide, our starting point um, for the third edition is the second edition because it is the latest version that was actually published by API. 
The first edition will absolutely be used as reference. It's, it's not going away. It will very much be part of the process. Um, we're also reviewing findings and recommendations from the, uh, the work that uh, uh, the FEMSA-led Public Awareness Program Working Group did. And then subsequent to that, there was an API-led ad hoc team that reviewed those, those findings and um, further narrowed down some recommendations for a third edition. So we'll also be working uh, with the work that that team did. Um, and as, Chris, as Christy mentioned, um, looking at you know, wh where we may have opportunities to align with 1173. Um, there's some really great information in 1173. If you haven't already taken a look through it, I do encourage you to, uh, to do that. Um, and then there are several areas where we're looking at additional research and guidance from subject matter experts, um, people who just know more about these things than we do. Um, are there alternative ways to communicate our baseline messages and our baseline programs? There has to be a better way than direct mail. We don't know what it is yet. Direct mail is what most operators are using. But technology has changed. Abilities have changed um, over the last 14 years, even over the last seven years. And so how do we, let's look at some of those and determine can they meet our documentation requirements and are they auditable? Um, effectiveness measurement. Um, are, we, are we looking at the right measures? Are we, you know, is the process still effective when we look at defining the effectiveness of our programs? Uh, behavior change has been mentioned quite a bit. Um, in behavior change communications in particular, we know it's a process to get someone to change their behavior. The first step is getting them to understand that they're not aware, they're not aware of something. That's the first step. The second step is then making them aware. But along the way, to get them through the process, you have to have their agreement to go through the process. So, and it's a long one. Look at seat belts, that took 20 years. Um, and there are still people who don't wear their seat belts. Um, so it's, it's a process and we need to somehow figure out a way to um, reflect that appropriately in, um, in the third edition. And then risk communications obviously is a big piece of this. We do have a specialist in risk communications already on the team. Um, so that is something that, uh, that will be incorporated and we'll be looking at as we go forward. And then with all that, the uh, publication date that we're working towards is December of 2020. So we've got time to sort of work through um, all these things and make sure that uh, we're getting, we're looking at all these things from the right perspectives. I guess right is subject to the individual because we're not all the same to Matt's point earlier. Um, and we don't all come from the same place. Um, and there's a lot of different opinions and a lot of different perspectives in the room um, on the uh, 1162 revision team, and that's, that's wonderful. That's um, it's fantastic because then we can actually look at things from all those different perspectives and put views and objections and opinions on the table and talk through them um, and figure out what's really going to work as we move 1162 forward. I know I went over, sorry. With that, I'll wrap up. All right. time for some questions oh, and I'm trying to make this mic work and failing terribly good you have to hold it to make it work that's one's busted let's see here this is me with my public official hat on I know it's a hard to believe that I'm a public official but uh, I am it's hard for me to believe too um, the trust was recently asked by the Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission and their advisory committee to do a uh, study, kind of a report on pipeline safety in Washington State. And one of the things we wanted to do is, because the advisory committee is very interested in public awareness, is kind of test that. So one of the things we did was a survey that's still underway, but we've, we've got a, a little bit underway. We reached out to 379 elected officials, city council members, county council members, mayors, which is basically every jurisdiction in Washington State that has pipelines in their jurisdiction. What we found is 35% uh, um, of those responding were county commissioners or county council members, 65% were city council members, and they had averaged at least six years in, the, in their elected positions. So under 1162, they should have got messages a couple of times at least. Uh, the response was that uh, slightly less, slightly less than 50% don't ever recall receiving any information from pipeline companies. 
of the 50% that do remember receiving information from pipeline companies, um, about 50% could not remember the name of the pipeline company. You know, the 50% that remember receiving information from companies, uh, a little over 50% either could not recall what the information was about or thought it was of little value. When asked, oh, while in office, have you ever received a briefing on pipeline safety, 85% of them said no. We, and we kind of limited that briefing to like 30 minutes or less. When we asked them, would you like a briefing on pipeline safety, 65% of them said yes. So there's clearly a desire among elected officials to know more about pipelines, um, and they don't think they're getting it. Um, we then asked, is there information about pipelines in your jurisdiction that you're interested to know and you don't know where to find it? And 65, 69% said, yes, they're interested in the information that they don't know where to find, and those are the top three answers. Who regulates pipelines? Where you find maps of pipelines? What fuels are in the pipelines? Some of those are messages from 1162. So it seems like there's a disconnect in 10 years of effort on 1162 in what at least elected officials remember. And as an elected official, I say, well, that's not too surprising because most of them aren't very smart. But uh, um, th that's a whole different topic. Um, the, the other interesting thing I'll just mention on this last slide, we listed about 12 different things that you might be interested in to, so they could check the box. The lowest response was, uh, call before you dig in 811. There was very in little interest in finding out about that. And I wish there was another question because I don't know if that's because they already got that information so they don't need to find out more or if they don't even know what it is so they didn't check the box. So that's just kind of the reality check we did uh, in Washington State of the elected officials that are supposed to be getting this type of stuff. Thank you, Carl. All right, so I think I'm going to give um, the mic to Dr. Babcock just to respond um, to some of the comments that were responses to his report. And then, and then I'd like to open it up to questions. Hello? Yeah, um, yeah sorry. Uh, yeah, I, um, I, gu I guess my main, I mean, as you pointed out, right? I mean, the report was, the purpose of the report was to look specifically at RP 1162 and the regulations. Um, and so both time-wise and in terms of the mandate, in terms of what I was looking at, I wasn't looking at you know going across the country and visiting with people, which should be done. I think, right, it's kind of one of those things where to find out what's really happening, I think that's, that's what, that, and that's what you guys are doing, I think, in your, in your, in your, um, um, in your process. Um, I think um, to the part about the, the, the the enhanced versus the, the baseline part. I so I, I understand that right. It's an iterative process. You want to you want to keep on communicating. I'm 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 just saying that based upon some of the research, it's and this is this is pertains both to risk communication and public participation in, in kind of government regulation and government things. It's one of those one of those instances where it keeps on coming up that it, the earlier the better is like a typical refrain, um, and it's it's not just to satisfy folks in the public who feel like they're left out of the process, it's also because it, it tends to be more, or at least some of the research has shown that, it, that it, it, it saves kind of effort down the line from, from the communicator's perspective. Um, because you don't go down these wrong tracks, which we tend to do, I guess. Um, but yeah, overall, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know, uh, I mean, I think we're all kind of agreement in the general kind of concepts and stuff, so I don't know. I guess my work is done as a moderator. Everybody agrees with everybody else. Nope. Okay. <laughs> no. All right. Perhaps not. So uh, I'm teasing. All right. Questions. I hope we have lots of questions. It looks like we have some questions. Okay. Um, here in the front. Rebecca, you wanted to ask a question? I do want to ask a question. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, um, I would like to just more or less uh, confirm what uh, Carl just uh, reported. In another life, I worked for a utility company, and we would constantly get in trouble with the local municipalities because we would not say anything. We would go and do things, leaving the elected officials in the dark. They would find that to be very embarrassing. They would be angry, and it impacts their careers because they are elected officials. So one of the things they always wanted to know is, 
most of the times, the public is not going to go to the regulatory agencies for information. They're going to go to the elected officials. And there they are, as my daughter would put it when she was smaller, fat, dumb, and happy. So it's critical that, and I'm sure if that same survey were done any place else in the country, we would probably get similar results. Thank you. Quick question for Christy. Um, as, as FEMSA is um, considering the soon to be revised um, 1162, do you expect to take the opportunity to um, use it to incorporate uh, requirements that will comply with the NTSB recommendation following San Bruno that operators provide system specific information to uh, first responders in communities that they their pipelines go through? Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Um, absolutely, one of the things that came out of NTSB's report, even what we looked at when we did our inspections, and also from the SWOT analysis report, um, and we talked about it a bit here around what operator-specific messages are relevant and important. Some of the things that we've already been working on with the emergency response, com that community, um, is really working with that community and different stakeholders to understand what information are they most interested in. One of the things we found out is some of the things that we were sharing, they didn't necessarily need in its entirety. But there are certain aspects of information that they were more interested in than others. And I think that has to be part of the conversation as we move forward, um, looking at the individual stakeholder audience groups, because I suspect their needs may be different. Emergency responders are looking for information different from a elected official, and it could be different from a homeowner who may have some changes going on with the system in their area. But certainly in all those cases, um, we have to have conversations around what information is more um, of a national message that across the board all would be, in, would be interested in or we need to make sure we raise awareness and then what more specific information would any particular audience group or affected group need to have. So that's something that's still on the table. Um, I just I just want to be clear. Um, operators are are already sharing system specific information with emergency responders. We may not it may not may need to be improved. We may not be providing the exact information as Christy said that they want. But I want to be, I want to make it clear that that is already happening, and I don't want anyone to have the impression that that is not happening at this point and hasn't been happening up to now. There are a lot of meetings a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations and trainings with emergency response departments in which that information is already being shared. It doesn't occur unless it's requested. So it'll happen upon request, but a lot of times they don't voluntarily do that until requested to come out. And I think that's fair. Um, I think that's fair. But you know, emergency responders are, are one of those audience groups, as are all of them actually, as I'm about to say this, that have competing priorities and pipelines typically fall low on lower on their priority list than than other information needs that they have. Hi, so I, I have somewhat of a statement tied into a question. Um, there's a lot of focus on communicating the risk communication and getting to decisions, especially when it comes to stakeholders, um, which I would also call them more landowners. You know, if you have these pipelines you need the land in order to lay the pipe, right? Um, and I happen to be a landowner, and I prefer not to be called a stakeholder because I didn't ask for a pipe to be buried on my farm, as many stakeholders do not. So when you're communicating risk to stakeholders or communities um, and trying to get them to decide there's this thing called eminent domain, right? And what is, if their decision is no, 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 what is the point to keep pushing them? I mean, the, these two-way communications, the conversations that are held by land agents who use communication tactics that are very bullying and manipulative. And, and maybe this is something that is being worked on of how can it be, I, I don't know. It's just a very frustrating experience on the ground for communities. And I have to agree that local officials 
um, supervisors and counties have no clue. Landowners find out first, right? Because that's where they need the access. So my question isn't really, it's more of a frustration I'm expressing, but maybe it is, what is the point of even getting people to make a decision when really it's deemed they're powerless to decide? I don't know. So I'll take a stab at it and share a little bit of my perspective. And one, I appreciate your distinction between being a landowner and just a general stakeholder because um, we generally define stakeholder, but we do recognize that there are um, different groups with different interests and needs and for different information, so we don't want to uh, minimize that in the conversation. In terms of um, information and informing different groups, I think that, one, we have to we have to be honest and say, hey, during those times where land needs to be accessed or there's decisions to be made around new construction or changes to systems, um, we recognize that there are opportunities for improved communication and engagement during those times. But I'll also add that the in informed decision making extends even beyond just the new construction. It extends to um, what to do if there's an existing pipeline in communities and there's new land development that may be encroaching on pipelines. So it's, it's a lot of different aspects of um, informed decision making that we're um, talking about. Not to say one is less or more important than the other, but just a recognition that there's a lot of different varying pieces that have to come into play as we talk about uh, making informed decisions. I think with communication, whether we call it awareness, risk communication, Pretty much, I haven't seen an instance yet where as people learn more about things, that now they have more information to make decisions on. And so that has to be, um, when I think about um, information for informed decision making, any information, the more you know, when you find out a little, that may probe you to want to know more. And so there's opportunities to better engage with operators or operators to engage with different audiences and landowners and stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Um, to make sure that as information is requested, that information is shared, talked about in a very appropriate and candid manner. Okay, yeah, there we go. So um, Matt can maybe verify this, but I mean, I think one of the really interesting things that comes out of the literature is that trust is really important for communication long term. And I think one of the most difficult issues in pipelines is the ways in which um, the process at the beginning doesn't always create the kind of trust that then you need really over the operational life of the pipeline because you are now part of the pipeline safety system, right? Whether you want to be or not, you are now part of it. Um, and part of these communications are designed to engage you so that you know about the kinds of issues that are necessary to make sure that pipelines are safe. Um, and yet, I hear from you that you don't feel a lot of trust. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue for these kinds of communications. I think we got time for one more. Hey. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alexis Bonagoski. I'm on the board of the Pipeline Safety Trust. Just as a um, brief background, I had an oil spill hit my farm um, on the Yellowstone River in 2011. And I also have a pipeline underneath my farm. I just received this from Philip 66 in the mail. And it was in a white envelope. And I talked to my neighbors, um, still in a pretty rural community, and um, I doubt anyone even opens the envelope, let alone reads this booklet. Um, I, I guess my viewpoint is I wonder why we've gotten away from just people talking to each other. If, if someone from Philip 66 came to my house, knocked on my door and said, hey, you've got this pipeline underneath your farm. This is where it is. Do you have any questions? Here's what happens if you accidentally dig. Um, in lots of communities, this is still possible. But the more we try to reach the most people, the less people listen. So the communication has to be more strategic about who you're talking to in the community. So in my community, I'm a person who is known to know about pipelines. So if people have questions about it, they come to me. So if someone from Phillips 66 and I had a relationship, instead of it being a brochure I get every, I don't, I don't even know, I'm, 
how often I get these. Um, it just, it might go a lot further. And so I just think instead of trying to get big, we need to get small. And I think money would be better spent on hiring people in communities to talk to each other about pipelines instead of spending money on brochures. That's just my thought. I don't really have a question. Well, so much for that question. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Um, it's, I think you raise an important point and an important discussion point as we go forward um, just on communications and engagement in general, right? Um, with regards to 1162, and the reality is right now, um, Phillips 66 and every other pipeline operator is held to a regulation that requires that we provide a baseline information to um, all of our audiences within a certain distance of the pipeline, and that changes for each audience group. Um, and so unless there's a change in that, some sort of baseline communication will come to you at whatever frequency the the regulation says it has to come to you. I mean, that's just going to happen because we're required to do that by federal law. Um, I know when I was at Enbridge every year working through the program, we would get multiple requests, remove me from your mailing list, remove me from your mailing list. Um, and every time we would research where is that individual in relation to, you know, the uh, the buffer we're required to mail within, did we make a mistake? Usually the answer was no, and they fell within that buffer, and we were required by law to actually provide that baseline communication. Now, that said, um, a face-to-face -face communication of some kind is always gonna be much more effective. Completely agree with you on that. Um, and for some smaller operators, um, that is still possible. And even for some larger operators, there might, you know, depending on how they run their supplemental or enhanced programs, it could still be possible. Um, but when you're talking to certainly on the larger operator side, um, I know at Enbridge, I mailed more than a million baseline communications every year, and that was just to meet the very basic baseline requirements. We, we don't have a million people to go have those conversations. We don't even have, we didn't even have, you know, probably even in the hundreds of people we could pull away from their daily job of keeping the pipeline safe and operating the pipelines to go have those conversations. So it's, while I absolutely 100% agree with you that would be much more effective, in reality, there are constraints around that that we also have to take into account. That's, unfortunately, that is the reality of, of what we're dealing with. And I'd like to add real quick to that, um, I appreciate your, your comment. Um, about really that face-to-face -face interaction. And it certainly has its place in communications. But I will offer this. And, um, you know, as a regulator, our goal is to encourage various ways of communicating. And the brochures is just one of many ways that um, communication should be taking place. But what I will say is, you know, for example, I live in a community where I live near uh, Quantico. One day I realized I'm hearing all this shaking, the house is vibrating all day, I'm teleworking. So I'm like, well, what is going on with this? So I make a few phone calls only to find out that there's a, a test bombing site. Um, apparently, I'm, I fell within that radius. So what I had to do is take action to find out what I didn't know. So what I'm saying is we talk a lot about two-way communication. I'm not, I'm not at all minimizing the need for information from landowners, from public officials, et cetera. But when you want to know more information, seek it out as well. Sometimes it'll come to you. Sometimes it may not come to you in ways in which you would normally expect it to, and it varies depending on individuals. But don't be afraid to seek it out. I know Carl had one slide about the uh, elected officials and what they knew and what they wanted to know more of. Well, a follow-up question I had was, how many of them did any follow-up to find out and ask more specific questions? And those are unique opportunities that um, we should all be seeking out to find out what we don't know because with the complexity of what's going on, um, you may have to reach out with more specific targeted questions so that you can get the answers you're looking for as well. Yes, that's part of the challenge. That's part of the challenge. Uh, and I was just gonna add quickly about um, two things. One, I guess there's areas here where I think additional research and like current research comes into play. Um, 
stuff that has to do with network analysis and who, who are the people that are really important in the community in order to kind of, again, target those, those resources. Do you have to mail it to everybody? You do now because of the mandate. Is the mandate based on this idea that you just got to get it to them um, right, what was the history, right, the history back, you know, 10 years or so, right? And I think there's more updated information about, right, who to target and why to target those people, how to target uh, groups that, that, right, the impact of that one person getting, getting the message is far greater. I think the other space where, where there's ongoing research, and I think this is helpful too, is we talk a lot about, you know, so face-to-face -face is better than, than, than not face-to-face -face has been said a couple of times, which is true in most cases. But even interactions between people in the same room, there, there are different ways of doing that, right? There's your, your old school traditional community meeting where the politicians sit in the, stand in the front and, and talk and community members, sit, and if it's a contentious issue, then basically it becomes a role playing exercise where the politicians are saying their line and the people in the audience are kind of you know, expressing their values but not really having a conversation. You could have more things that are uh, thing kind of strategies such as like there's a liberal democracy strategy where you have you you kind of get away from those types of meetings to meetings that really are more about sharing your experience, and it sounds kind of you know kumbayaish, but it's not. It actually is. That's the evidence. You're actually sharing what you actually experience as opposed to falling into the trap of the I'm I don't like what you say, so I'm going to play the role of you know not liking anything you say, kind of and you know kind of the breakdown of trust. So I think those are two areas where where I think current research into how to communicate in large groups and how to communicate across like the use networks to communicate better, I think are two places that I think maybe should be looked into as well. Um, those are, I think, more current kind of things. So it's, a mix, again, the mix of <laughs> how do you pass the rule and iterate with the research. But I think those are kind of interesting areas that could be helpful. Re Rebecca. I've been authorized to allow one more comment. <laughs> <laughs> operators in my jurisdiction. I only ha know who one of them is, have ever had contact with one of them. I'm the pipeline guy and everybody in the city and county government knows I'm the pipeline guy. I talked to our assistant chief a month ago when we met with Magellan. He had never ever met a pipeline operator before in our jurisdiction. It's, it's what you're talking about with the network. The operators need to identify the key people along their pipeline routes whether it's uh, county or city government, um, and sometimes neighborhood people, reach out to those people. That's how you build the trust, um, and you can do that. I know very well on a first name basis with the maintenance supervisor for the Longhorn Pipeline for hit that segment of pipeline. He knows me, he, he can call me, I have his cell phone number. I should have that for every operator in my jurisdiction, but I don't. That's on the operators. 1162 is the is the the lowest bar. The operators, if they want to build trust in their communities, they've got to do more, and they've got to do it on a face to face basis. And you don't have to do it with millions of people. It's thousands, but it's not millions. Mm -hmm. Great. We're going to close this session, but I want to let you know that Matt's report is going to be on the Pipeline Safety Trust website if you want to read it. Um, he comes out of a great PhD program on decision science, and we really appreciate his, uh, his work on this issue as well as all the panelists. Thank you. And, and because the two groups are out of sync now, we're going to take a break and we're going to start both next sessions at 3.30.
literature. And um, I've been living a double life for a few years. But recently, I've uh, begun to try and figure out how to merge my pipeline life with my academic life. And what that has meant is that uh, I'm joining a number of scholars in humanities disciplines, fields like philosophy, history, anthropology, even literary studies, uh, who are bringing their training and their particular ways of knowing to thinking about energy. But thinking about energy not just in terms of economics or engineering, but in terms of culture and ethics and even aesthetics, for example. Um, I was struck this morning when Brenda Kenny uh, said, um, she spoke about the importance of external perspectives and, and the need to challenge assumptions. And I think that nicely sums up the premise of this panel, because historians and anthropologists and literary scholars, and we have one of each, uh, ask different kinds of questions than the kinds of technical and quantitative ones that tend to dominate conversations about pipeline safety. Um, and historians and anthropologists and literary scholars uh, are especially good at interrogating and challenging assumptions. And so it's in that spirit that, that we think these other perspectives uh, might have something productive to bring to these proceedings and to our ongoing conversations about pipeline safety. Uh, and so I'm especially excited uh, to introduce these three um, very accomplished scholars from whom I have learned so very much, and I'm really excited to bring them into our conversations about pipeline safety. So I'm going to introduce them all now, um, and then I'm just going to let them do their thing. Um, so Dr. Karen Kleeman is an associate professor of history at the University of Houston, and she's also the co-director of the Graduate Certificate in Global Energy Development and Sustainability, about which more in one second. Um, she's currently working on her second book, which is called Before the Curse, Petroleum, Politics, and U.S. Oil Companies in the Gulf of Guinea, Africa, 1890s to 1980s. The book chronicles the political and economic impacts of international oil companies in sub-Saharan Africa during the long 20th century. Um, and along with uh, Mr. Tom Mitro, a retired regional CFO for Chevron in Angola, she co-founded the GEDS certificate I mentioned a moment ago, which trains energy industry employees, government officials, and NGO leaders in the current best practices for developing oil and gas projects that will be beneficial for all stakeholders. She's also the recipient of numerous grants and fellowships, as well as I was excited to learn the University of Houston's Teaching Excellence Award. Very cool. Uh, she's delivered lectures and papers on African oil uh, history for the U.S. State Department, MIT, the University of uh, Ibadan, Ibadan. Ibadan, Nigeria, the Rachel Carson Center in Munich, the University of Oklahoma, Texas A&M, Brown University, Boston University, as I said, very accomplished. Um, up next is Dominic Boyer who is professor of anthropology at Rice University, and he's the founding director of the Center for Energy and Environmental Research um, in the Human Sciences. Um, the first recent research center in the world designed specifically to promote research on the energy environment nexus in the arts, humanities, and social sciences. He's part of the editorial collective of the journal Cultural Anthropology, and he's the author of the book The Life Informatic, Newsmaking in the Digital Era, published in 2003. More recently, he's co-editor of the book Energy Humanities, an anthology. It's really great. And he's currently collaborating with Simony Howe on another book uh, with the intriguing title Energy Politics. Did I say that right? Um, which will explore the complexities of wind power development in southern Mexico. Um, Dominic and uh, Howe are also co-hosts of a podcast called Cultures of Energy. And I just want to say it's totally fabulous. Um, you can find it on iTunes and where, wherever else you find podcasts. But really, it's really uh, fantastic. It's so good. Um, yes, and, and both Jennifer and Karen have uh, had episodes, and they're great. They're really great. Uh, OK, finally, Jennifer Wenzel is an associate professor of English and African studies at Columbia University. Her research and teaching focus on post-colonial studies and energy and environmental humanities. Um, for her first book, she was awarded honorable mention for the Perkins Prize by the International Society for the Study of Narrative, which is a big deal. Um, she's also co-editor with Imre Jamin and uh, Patricia Yeager um, of Fueling Culture, 101 Words for Energy and Environment. It's a compendium of keywords on the intersections of energy and culture. It too is great. I'm using it uh, for my students in my class this semester, and they love it. Um, her essay, Petromagic Realism Towards a Political Ecology of Nigerian Literature, was reprinted in the Energy Humanities 
uh, reader, edited by Dominic Boyer and Imri Jamin. Um, and she's just finished up a book manuscript entitled Reading for the Planet, World Literature and Environmental Crisis. And she's begun a new book project called The Fossil Fueled Imagination, How and Why to Read for Energy. Um, I should stop enthusing and let them speak. Good afternoon. It's a joy to be here. I'm so thrilled. I, as you heard, I tend to work on international issues. So this domestic conference with a domestic focus is really enlightening. And I'm astounded at how much you guys are thinking along the same lines of things that we're doing too. So I'll come, I'll come forth with a little bit of that. I wanted to talk to you about today about energy transitions and oil history and ways that liberal arts thinking can add value to oil and gas and pipeline companies. And the liberal arts are the A in STEAM. You know, there's a lot of debate about STEM and the push for STEM and how people should add in the arts. So the A in STEAM stands for liberal arts. And I'm going to talk to you about our two key energy transitions today and how these skills uh, can be brought to your companies. And as, he, as um, Jeffrey noted, I do run that program. And what we do in the program at GEDS is analyze, predict, and teach students. We teach students how to analyze, mitigate, predict and mitigate problems that are going to come up on the ground when they start an oil and gas project in, it was originally developing nations, but now we had to change our literature to say new production sites. So in the sense of we're looking a lot at upstream, not so much pipelines, but we can use our materials for application in the U.S. too because a lot of similar problems come up. So I wanted to just get really clear with you in the beginning about what liberal arts are because people tend to think liberal arts equals humanities and that's not the case. And so I have a slide there that's not, so, oops, sorry. Let me put this. Some current slide, yeah. It's nice how we have this slide down here. So this might seem a little basic, but it's important to understand that liberal arts is very broad training. It includes mathematics and national, national, uh, natural sciences. Um, it's designed to give students very, very broad skills and knowledge, not a specific technical skill like engineering or tech industry type things. From its origins among the Greeks um, to the present day, liberal arts provides an overarching study of humankind, the history and cultures of societies, the physical world we live in, and the natural laws of science we are bound by. For many years, the liberal arts have been considered a very impractical course of study you know, deemed useless for getting a job. You have to end up being a barista or working at McDonald's if you take this degree. But as we move out of um, the industrial age into what some people are calling the second machine age, where it's beginning already that tech or artificial intelligence is taking over routine tasks, the liberal arts are seeing a renaissance and seen, especially among tech companies, as critical to the well-being and to the innovation and creativity needed as they move forward. It's become something somewhat cutting edge if you've followed articles and books that are coming out. So I want to lay out some of the skills that um, tech people value in the liberal arts degree. And these are taken from three or four articles that I just got off the internet as I was trying. I gathered these because our history majors are disappearing and we have to convince them to come back. So we, I'm gathering arguments for why it's important. So um, these are ideas from tech companies in that, you know, creativity isn't something you can program and innovation. It's got to come from the human mind. So they really could, in some of the companies, they'll have 25% engineer that the rest is going to be dealing with other new innovation or marketing and that type of stuff. So they like the way that liberal arts majors are able to be more creative and um, manage the data rich world. Also making clear arguments, knowing how to argue and know how to write rhetorically, to write clearly as you've seen in even the reports we were talking about in the last session. And more importantly, to follow an argument all the way down. One of the leaders of the tech uh, in the article was a philosophy major and he said that his ability to follow an argument all the way down allowed him to run very effective meetings and also group projects to not lose track. Um, to be able to think critically and re recognize and engage with multiple perspectives. Liberal arts people tend to be comfortable in the gray. They don't seek the gray, the black and white. They're comfortable and actually thrive on playing with ideas in those gray areas. And understanding how and why thoughts and beliefs have changed, that would be philosophy and history, and we're in this such immense change now. These under, knowing patterns are important about that. 
And then thinking about the larger moral questions, especially for tech companies, what kind of communities and world are they trying to create? What, what are the ethical issues they have to deal with? And in the end, it's essentially marketing, connecting with end users and figuring out what they want because they've got to serve that population. So um, I've been watching this literature grow and grow and grow, but I never see anybody from the oil and gas or pipeline industries talking about liberal arts majors. And I'm going to present to you an argument that we've been in this industry. It's been a little over hyper focused on production. And that has led to uh, dominance of engineers in the upper echelons of the companies. And the repercussions of that are pretty real and that the social skills are not as developed. And with transitions that are happening today, we might need to think about liberal arts training for your employees that you have or for the people coming up in the engineering schools, that type of thing, to start integrating it because we're in such a period of change. So the two transitions, you know these. I've been here for the whole day now. And uh, this one here, I've just got some data that I don't need to really go through. But this whole North American energy renaissance is really, really big. This is a gigantic change if you're going to look at the history of oil. And it's really important to recognize that this type of production in the US has not taken place since really the 1950s. And that the United States of today is not the same as it was back then. It is not your grandfather's USA. So we are no longer a nation on the cusp of becoming a s global superpower with a burgeoning economy and bright outlook for the future. We actually a society with a lot more social malaise at this point and not a great sense of hope for the future. The oil industry is seen differently with the history of oil spills. There have been tragedies behind us that are not easily forgotten. Since really, I always say my first trauma as a child was the Santa Barbara oil spill. I lived in Ventura and, and watched that happen. Um, so these don't go out of the mind. Also, we're in the age of super, super majors and super, super profits. While economic inequality within the US is at the highest it's ever been. So when a for-profit pipeline company shows up and gets the government to help them invoke eminent domain, it just does not work the, way, the same way anymore as in the 50s. There's just a lot of anger pent up. There's a lot of um, emotion. It just does not play out in the same way. And as a historian, we think about these things. And I think if you could get historian, if you could think that way also with a pipeline, it might help mitigate problems before they start. It's thinking about the populations you're meeting. Also, outside of Texas and Louisiana, sometimes even in these states, there are just real disdain for any company dealing with oil. Um, this is much more widespread and embedded than ever before. And it's very unconscious on some levels. I have a 14-year-old. She's part of Generation Z. And I've been watching movies with her since she was three. And I love this example. Every movie, every kid movie, the Muppets, Legos, Cars 2. Who's the evil, evil antagonist? An oil guy or an oil company. And we watch that, and we don't think about the dysfunctionality of that, because that diverts our attention. It allows us to be angry at oil companies, and the consumers never have to question their consumption. And you know if you want to change an oil company, you have to change consumption patterns. That's our lesson we could learn over the past 60 years. So I'm not, I have a problem. I've just recently been trying to watch this show called Tin Star, which is like this, it's the craziest, most evil oil company you could ever see in, in, in Western Canada. So it's shocking these kind of what we call tropes that come out and how we use them. So um, along these same lines, I wanted to point out that Ernst & Young came out with this report last summer that was actually quite shocking to me. And it was about the millennials and Generation Z and how they really do not want to go into the oil industry. So these are some of the statistics. 62% um, of the Gen Z, these were the teenagers now, since 1995 born, just d found, 62% found it unappealing, 39% very unappealing. They thought all the, the jobs in ONG were blue collar, physically demanding and dangerous. When they were asked to name a typical oil and gas job, only 10% can name engineer. And I really think that's a Texas thing. People in Texas see it as a prestigious <coughs> industry, but outside, that's not the perception. I didn't grow up with that perception in California. 64% um, believe the industry causes problems rather than solves them. And 66 rank green energy jobs as appealing. There's a lot of questions about the sampling. I called up the company and asked the people who did this. I can talk to you about that later. But um, nobody in Texas believes this. They just kind of threw it away. But I think it's important to recognize. The report concludes, most teens believe strongly that oil companies do not care what's best for their generation, even though teens say they have the most significant stake in long-term environmental outcomes due to their age. 
And as a historian, I think, remember, these are the first group of students who, a uh, group of children who are getting this unconscious messaging that's very heavy in films they've watched. It's the first generation to grow up in the midst of the debates and repercussions about climate, ch of climate change. The first in 60 years to witness production on domestic soil. And the first to be so heavily embedded in, I, in uh, social media. They actually want to call these guys I generation instead of Generation Z. There's a debate about that. So when accidents and uh, conflicts show up, they're, they're put throughout the world in unprecedented ways. It's a, just a very different environment. In terms of um, dealing with all this domestic production and the public image issues, you simply can't use methods. We have a 50 year gap, 60 year gap in like how you're gonna actually approach this. And what, um, there's a great deal of expertise out in the world if you look abroad, because this has been going on in Africa, people have been studying it. There's actually a body of literature in political science and e economics called the natural resource curse theory about countries that get massive amounts of revenues and just don't do well. If poverty increases, governments get more authoritarian. So there's a great deal of material to pull from. We don't have to start from square one here about how you deal with stakeholders and local communities and do SWOT analysis and those types of things. All these social science tools that are showing up on the screens here are what I actually teach in our GEDS program about dealing with African communities or Albanians came to our program last year. We tend to use it in many different contexts. So. Um, for example, another good one is the complexities of negotiating with multiple tribal communities in where th shared authority prevails. No general oil guy's gonna know how to do that, but people who've been working in Africa have, because the systems of power in those contexts are totally different than what we normally think we're dealing with. So the second transition I wanna talk about is this push to reduce carbon emissions from fossil fuels. You know all these things that are happening. Uh, many people actually in Houston are saying the transition's already in place. And whether we want to believe it or not, you know, the issue is while we're fighting it out here, the world is moving on and their own reasons for doing so. China isn't really, maybe they're concerned about global change, but their people are choking from smog. So there's incentives to do this that are much beyond the debate that we're actually having. Um, what it means is that in terms of national markets, people are going to have much more choice in terms of their sources of energy. And I'm not even beginning to say that the industry, the oil industry will die out because it sustains our entire way of modern life, it will not die out. But there is probably going to be a need to think about different products that don't put out so much carbon emissions. What are those products gonna be? How are we gonna market them? And that's a really big change. And all of these are gonna need liberal arts skills. I wanted to show you from history um, this example of 1931 when marketing and refining was how oil companies made their money. It was the source of major profits. And what leadership within the, it was so, con well, it was vacuum oil, which in 1931 joined with Standard Oil of New York and became Soconi Vacuum, and they were the third largest oil company in the world, very famous for being able to go out into far corners of the earth and sell their goods. In 1963, this became mobile. But at that time, leadership was based on experience with the world rather than a technical experience rooted in engineering. Um, it had three major company, the committees uh, that directed the company, and the one that did, dealt with overseas sales was the Refined Oil Marketing Committee. And these are the characteristics from this article that I have. I got from the ExxonMobil archives at UT Austin. Um, a director had to have maintenance of a broad international viewpoint, embracing, among other things, the buying and selling habits of many diverse peoples. And this is using terminology we don't use anymore, but it said the oriental viewpoint of the Near East must be as well understood as the Occidental, and the national characteristics of all countries must be taken into account. And then this one, which is really applicable in this modern context in the US, a careful study on the ground of company organization and general conditions, thereby securing an actual knowledge of the ramifications of the business in detail and perspective. It's old timey English from 1931, but the ideas are there. All of these skills got lost in the oil industry as the push for production became more prominent and profits were made off of production. And oil historians know the exact moments that that happened. It happened in 1950 and it happened because of the Saudi government. And the Saudi government was pushing Aramco to give it more and more money and Aramco didn't want to lose profits but didn't want to lose the concessions. So the State Department got together with the company and decided to give them a tax write-off and it's called the Golden Gimmick. And what that did was allow Aramco to write off any payments it made to the Saudi king as a tax write-off and made their profits, profits soar. 
that was kept under wraps for seven years, but once other companies got that vision and understood that, production became all about, production became the main goal. And gas stations just became outlets for getting rid of this flood of oil. So if you want to read about that in an interesting way, you can read this book, and this is what Samson said about it. All the dynamic energy of the companies went into production and exploration. Engineers and geologists dominated the boards, while marketing men were at a discount. The companies were preoccupied with the simple word crude. And we've come to think of the oil industry as only this. We forget the downstream, and the downstream may likely become much more important as we transition into different kind of energy uses. My last things I want to talk to you about are these two examples from the real world today. These are scholars and academicians who are bringing, um, and actually engineers, who are really pushing for liberal arts to be incorporated. This first one is a professor at Harvard. He is um, an expert on tax policy and international and corporate finance. He's in the business and law school. He is a professor of finance, and he said, over the past 50 years, finance has become more qualitative, precise, elegant, and abstract. It's wonderful for the discipline, but too detached from the reality of daily life for most people. He said, the work, and work, the work has become more about value extraction than value creation. And the result is people have come to see the field as complex and rooted in greed and essentially evil. So he wrote a book that teaches finance not through charts and graphs, but through stories. He does this through close readings of writers like Nietzsche or the Ecclesiastes or the Talmud. And he's pre he says that presenting issues from multiple angles, multiple disciplines, is the best way for his students to learn. And critical for him is framing finance, this finance work in a moral context. In finance, he says, we have lost the ability to think through the questions that humanities force us to think through. He also says that he wants both practitioners and outsiders to get rid of these stereotypes and caricatures, that business and finance are evil, and that humanities are divorced from the real world. Another one is a very young woman who was one of the leaders and still is in uh, Silicon Valley. She was the fifth person hired at the platform Quora, which answers all your questions and never starts, stops bugging you on your email. And ninth at Pinterest, so she's been really in the startup. And she began designing the Quora uh, platform, but had to start dealing with social issues. She had been an engineering steward at Stanford, had internships with Google and, my, and uh, Facebook, standard stuff and didn't ever really take her uh, humanities training seriously. So when she began designing this platform, she started realizing all the issues she was needing around social, around society and human beings, something that she was not exposed to. Who should the platform serve? What kind of community was she trying to create? And they, what behaviors would it incentivize? What kind of value did it want to put into the world? Then she had to deal with this issue of designing the black button, the blocking function. She had to think, are f people fundamentally good or bad? She had to decide what to do about abusers and harassers and trolls. And what about free speech and moderation? And as a result of that, she's become a person that's a really big advocate for put, bringing the liberal arts into tech training. And this is a really good quote that I'm going to leave you with. She said, ruefully, and with some embarrassment at my younger self's condescending attitude towards the humanities, I now wish I strived for proper liberal arts education, that I'd learn how to think critically about the world we live in and how to engage with it, that I'd absorb the lessons about how to identify and interrogate privilege, power structures, structural inequality, and injustice. This one's so important with what we're doing today, that I'd had the opportunities to debate my peers and develop informed opinions on philosophy and morality. Even more than that, I wish I realized that these were worthwhile thoughts to fill, with, fill my mind with, and that all of my engineering work would be contextualized by such subjects. So with the ending that, I just want to be my professor, history professor self, and say, please consider the importance of these skills as you move through your decision making and your hiring processes. And if you need any, um, I can tell you exactly how to get the, the schools to start bringing this into the training of people you hire if you need that. Thank you. That's good. Okay. Well, let, let me just. Um, let me just add a word of thanks. I want to thank Jeff for organizing this panel because it's really exciting to be here. 
I want to thank all of you for, for coming and, and listening to what we have to say. And a lot of what I'm going to say is going to maybe echo and perhaps duplicate things that Karen's already said. She's a tough act to follow. Um, but, you know, it's, I've learned a lot from you just from today. Uh, and I think there's a really incredibly powerful potential for exchange here. Uh, between this group and between folks who are interested in energy and environment issues in the humanities and social sciences. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, and as, as I'll just say this as a citizen of a city, Houston, that has an awful lot of pipelines in it, I'm really, really, really glad that you're doing what you're doing to keep pipelines safer. Um, thank you so much for that. So um, l let me. Uh, Jeff mentioned the, the center that I direct and that it's in some ways the first of its kind. I just want to explain to you, because a lot of people ask, you know, well, what are these energy humanities I'm hearing about? Uh, and I should also say that to, to Karen's slide that we also include a lot of social sciences in what we do. It was simply a branding decision to call it energy humanities because energy humanities and social sciences is a big mouthful. Um, and, you know, what we what we're basically, the pitch we made to our provost, who is sort of like the chief academic officer of Rice, was uh, everyone knows that um, energy systems are complex and they're dynamic. I think you, everyone in this room knows that. Anyone who looks at these questions carefully knows that. Um, and no one is doubting that the sciences uh, and the technologists and the engineers have a lot to say about how energy systems work. Uh, you can understand a lot about energy through those lenses. You can also understand a lot about energy through markets and, and policy analyses, too, which are also popular and often where the social sciences sneaks into the discussion these days. But when you think about energy choice and energy use, you also realize, and I think, again, I'm hearing a lot of this echoing in the room already, that there are questions of habits and institutions and beliefs and worldviews and ethics and networks. And all of these are other social and cultural dimensions of energy systems uh, that are very important. And they're very important when you are dealing with people um, or dealing with communities, uh, as, as many people in this room are. So uh, these are also things that humanists and social scientists have been studying for hundreds of years. So we have relevant expertise to bring to the table. And that really was the, the pitch for why to do a center like this in the first place. So um, with that in mind, I want to uh, basically give a little bit of an overview of what is going on in the field of energy humanities. I'm going to talk a bit about my own work. But unfortunately, that is mostly related to electricity and the future of, of the grid and to wind power. So what I'm going to try to draw to that research, I think, are some dynamics and aspects that are relevant to uh, a community that's focused on pipelines and pipeline safety. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge some of our forebears in my field, anthropology. There was this kind of maverick, crazy guy named Leslie White who decided in the 1940s that you could basically rewrite the entire theory of civilization through energy. Uh, and you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting article. Uh, and I wanted to throw it out here for those of you who might want to sort of think about how this fits within a longer term perspective in the humanities and social sciences. Uh, White was writing in that era in the early 1940s when you know atomic energy had been discovered, but but the bombs hadn't dropped yet. So people were thinking about you know all the amazing things we can do with these new magnitudes of energy, and that sent him thinking about well, hasn't humanity throughout its, its entire you know course of development also always been searching? for more energy, and how the energy decisions and the infrastructures that have been developed have influenced uh, how civilization has lived. And what he had interesting, I think, provocative ideas to this day. For example, one of them I mentioned here is that he had the idea that we are a consumer society because we became a fuel society. Like Once we became hooked on fuels, that's when consumption became a more important part of our culture. It wasn't you know, capitalism or something that did it. It was really related to our energy decisions and the infrastructures we've used. Now, energy humanities today, and I want to, you know, it wouldn't be a humanities talk without having a reading assignment. So I'm going to throw out this on assignment. I'm going to throw out a couple of books that I thought uh, I think people in this room might especially be interested in if you are, want to hear more and learn more. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Jennifer's Fueling Culture book, which is a great series of short pieces. 
Uh, also this book by Stephanie Lemeniger, who comes from an oil family uh, and who wrote this beautiful book, Living Oil, which talks about the influence of petroleum in American culture and just how deeply it goes. I mean, obviously, it's it, it, how it affects every aspect of our lives. And that's part of what we have to come and reckon with when we think about energy is not just our reliance upon something to, to feel like a vehicle, but the way in which it becomes part of every aspect of our lives, um, all the way down. I will also um, plug my own book. This is The Energy Humanities, one on the left, and this other book on fuel, another series of short essays about all kinds of fuel that have appeared uh, throughout human history, including some that haven't yet existed. So it's an imaginative, it's a kind of a thinking speculatively about what kind of fuels could exist in the future. OK, um, let me talk a little bit more in depth about this book, Carbon Democracy, which is probably the number one book I'd recommend for folks in this room. It's a really, really interesting piece of political history that basically argues that um, uh, democracy, as we understand it today, would not have been possible without fossil fuels, uh, but that also the shift from coal to oil signaled a very specific and important shift within how democracy was lived and institutionalized in places like the United States. Um, and his argument is basic. I won't go into it in great depth because I don't have enough time to, but essentially what he's arguing is that, I mean, this country, and I hope this won't be a controversial statement, it didn't really start off as a mass democracy, right? It started off as a republic in which people in powdered wigs got to make decisions on behalf of the rest of us, right? Um, the fact that it began to develop institutions of mass democracy actually had a lot to do, Mitchell argues, with coal. And coal is not, uh, not a fuel that gets a lot of love these days. But in Mitchell's book, he actually suggests that coal really built the infrastructures of contemporary democratic institutions because uh, of the material character of this fuel. It was deep underground. Uh, in a very specific number of places. So new infrastructures like railways had to be built to move it around. And the people who went underground to get it worked in often very dangerous conditions, but they also weren't really supervised by any managers. So they developed a sense of fraternity and identity underground. They also developed a very keen sense of the risks that were involved with this kind of um, fuel extraction. And they then became the point of the spear of the labor movement in the United States. And he talks at you know, great length about how the most effective kinds of political interventions of the labor movement were always led by coal miners. They are also struck much more often. And they had leverage because they could shut off um, the supply of these fossil fuels upon which, every again, everything in society was dependent at the time increasingly. Everything, every machine needed coal to fuel it. Um, so uh, he, in a sense, the, what got more of us involved in the democratic process had a lot to do with coal, coal mining, coal infrastructures, is his argument. Uh, that changed uh, a little bit when we get to the rise of oil, because oil, as you know, unlike coal, doesn't require the same labor force to extract it. Uh, it doesn't have the same infrastructures to move it around. And although pipelines, I'm sure everyone here is acutely aware, can be vulnerable, and they can also be vulnerable to political activism and intervention, um, also uh, don't have the, the same uh, capacity to be shut down that the coal strikes were able to do with the railroads and with the mines. So uh, that had a lot to do with transoceanic shipping. It had to do a, a lot with the ability to move oil on a global market. And indeed, one of the things that Mitchell argues eventually is that uh, what happened in the middle of the 20th century uh, was that as the United States and England were beginning to rebuild Europe, they tried to rebuild it as an oil-based economy in order to shut off some of the threat of these militant miners to reduce their political power. And that led in turn to a new set of institutions, uh, but also drove at the same time globalization. So you can look at it again, but it's not necessarily a, a moral story. It's a story about how fuel forms of fuel, the material character of fuel, the infrastructures of fuel also have effects upon uh, political institutions too. So I think it's a really interesting, for me, when I read this, I was a real wake up call like, oh yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. But I had never thought of it in those terms because we're so used to thinking of politics in terms of the exchange of ideas, not so much in terms of the material and infrastructural character. 
Okay, so I want to talk about my own work here and my work with uh, my partner, Simony Howe, and colleague at Rice University. And uh, this is a, a project that really focuses on the politics of wind power development in southern Mexico. And the takeaway here, uh, we think, is to emphasize that in cases where developers and governments uh, don't uh, take into account local histories, local political dynamics, local culture, it can lead to kind of ruinously contentious political situations regardless of what the resource is. And we're looking at when, how wind power became contentious, right? Not fossil fuels, although I think there are lessons that can be ported you know, between the two cases. So I want to take you to a place, I don't know whether you know about it, but if you're interested in wind power, it's an interesting place. It's called the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. It's that little, tiny little belt uh, in southern Mexico. And there's something rather amazing that happens. There's a little gap in the Sierra Madres. Um, and there's a barometric pressure differential between the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean that creates one of the most powerful wind tunnels on the planet, probably the best terrestrial wind resources anywhere. And it, the experience of the wind is intense. It's almost tropical storm force at times without there being any storm activity whatsoever. So you're just getting, if you're there in a bad windy day, you're getting pelted with gravel and stones. And it's really a, quite an intense experience. And uh, people living in the area were aware that this was an issue for many years because of things like this. And this is just during the year that we spent in this part of Mexico. Uh, this, is, this is wind that can flip tractor trailers. It's wind that can strip the paint off boats. It's really serious wind. And the Mexican government um, had the ambition as early as the 1970s to develop this resource when they did some tests uh, and saw that this, in fact, was you know, kind of off the charts. The USAID came in later and did another study. Um, at the same time, there were some efforts which really anticipates the energy reforms we've seen in Mexico more recently to open the electricity sector to more private investment, especially for industrial self-supply projects. And that's really what got this, uh, what got this going. Uh, and the Oaxacan government, as well as the Mexican government, be entered into a process of, of uh, incentivizing development in the 2000s. So we had, by the period of our main research between 2009 and 2012, we had already a dozen wind parks coming on grid with over a gigawatt of installed capacity. Now, um, there's a push and a pull factor here, too. Uh, Mexico is also very concerned about its declining oil uh, production. Again, I probably don't need to tell folks in this room that. Um, so part of the idea of, of doing investing in wind power was also to preserve more fossil fuels for sale, for export sale, because the government um, relies on those sales to a tune of over 40% of its revenue. So. Um, the idea of using wind power was, in part it had a climate agenda, in part it was a, a matter of domestic budget security at the same time. And uh, it all culminated in 2012 when President Calderon signed a law on climate that uh, mandated by 2024, I think it is, yeah, that 35% of Mexico's electricity would come from renewable resources, and a lot of that was meant to come from wind. So there was a real, there was a, kind of, there was a policy um, set up that was, became a really strong driver of development in this area. And so by today, we've got in the isthmus over um, 2.3 gigawatts of installed capacity. I don't know on what grounds this is verifiable, but people who work in the finance of these projects said that this was the densest concentration of onshore wind parks anywhere in the world now, with more to come, with still more to come before 2024. Now, that all sounds pretty good if you are a renewable energy advocate especially. But all is not well uh, in this um, paradise of wind development. Uh, since actually almost since the parks began to appear, uh, there has been fairly intense, sporadic at first resistance from indigenous communities, Binisa or Zapotec and uh, Ikots or Wave communities around this lagoonal region here have become increasingly concerned uh, about these projects. And they've outlined a number of uh, potential effects they're worried about, including rising social inequality, food insecurity, uh, including possible contamination 
the fishing communities around the lagoon are very concerned about dredging that might happen, and there's a range of other um, uh, of other problems. They've they've said there's been a lack of consultation. So again, I'm s well, from what I've heard so far here today, these are familiar problems, right, that are coming in this region. Now, what we uh, determined in the course of research is that they weren't simply there were a lot of grievances that were aired in this in the process of reacting to this development, but they weren't really about wind power per se. They were about other things. Uh, they were really much more focused upon the attempt to remediate a much longer history of a feeling of being neglected and abandoned by both the state and the federal governments. Uh, and in fact, this goes way back, the historical memory in the region goes back to the 1850s when there was actually a proposal on the table. Mexico was going to sell this uh, isthmus to the United States as uh, an alternative Panama Canal Zone. Okay, so that people remember that and they talk about this is yet another attempt to expropriate our land and give it away to the foreigners. Now, uh, it all came to a head, and I'm wrapping up, so just, we'll just take me a couple more minutes. Uh, it, all, it all came to a head in what, again, didn't get a lot of media attention, but was a spectacular event. It was kind of the Standing Rock uh, dapple event for wind power in southern Mexico. This was the Mourinho Renovables Park, which was going to be the largest single phase wind park ever built in Latin America. And it was going to be built on this little stretch of sandbar. Uh, in the lagoonal area on communal land that belonged to one of the communities. Um, but uh, what happened was, as I've said, um, it became, a, a, if you will, the, the match that set off the tinderbox of these long-standing uh, political grievances. And indeed what happened, it spread way past the wind park, which uh, was blockaded to the point where unfortunately uh, it was not able to be built, nor were they even able to find another site in the region to relocate it. Um, but what happened was it actually catalyzed uh, a pretty intense movement to, if you will, secede, essentially declare indigenous sovereignty in these communities and to withdraw from the political institutions of the Mexican state. So they were throwing out voting booths, they were throwing out political parties, they were in a sense uh, declaring a kind of autonomous rebellion against the state um, that was similar, I think, to those of you who remember the, the Zapatista uprising um, some decades before in neighboring Chiapas. It had some of the same some of the same dynamics to it. So, this was all sparked, if you will, by a, a wind park, but it wasn't really about the wind park. And that's what we where we get to the the need, in the sense, to to think about these things sometimes more expansively than just as matters of technology. There's nothing technologically wrong with this wind park. It's true that there are not a lot of examples of wind parks built on sandbars, but there weren't really technological challenges here. There weren't really policy uh, change. All of the, the um, government offices supported it had every permit conceivable, but it lacked at a very fundamental level legitimacy in the eyes of the local population. Uh, and I, we think, in, in our report to NSF, you know, we said this could have been done, this could have happened differently. This was not an inevitable outcome because I think there is a certain, sometimes you, one can fall into a certain cynicism, well, they're gonna reject anything. We believe there were very specific mistakes the company made, the developers made in this case, that led to this outcome. And this is a place where work with um, social scientists in this case, but I think in humanists more generally, can actually help to anticipate issues, to help resolve and broker disputes, uh, to have, again, a, in a sense, an adjudicator outside who can look uh, beyond the give and go between a developer and a community and sometimes be helpful in a consulting capacity. So that's what, um, that's what I wanted to end on uh, with a sense that culture matters and that sometimes, as you know, working with communities is, is, or not sometimes, always working with communities is important in terms of figuring out a risks and reward structure that works for both parties. Uh, at Rice, we are uh, here, SENS is the, what the acronym is, uh, culturesofenergy.com, and we would be you know, very happy to hear from anyone here who's interested in, in learning more about what we do. Thanks.
also, I'd like to uh, echo the thanks of uh, the previous speakers, both to Jeff and to the PSC, and also to all of you for hanging around for what I think I am the last speaker of the day. Is that right? So yeah. So thanks for, thanks for being here um, and hanging around. Um, I think that Karen and, and Dominic have given some sense of what we're up to in the energy humanities, but I can imagine that you're still wondering what does an English professor have to say about pipelines and pipeline safety? Um, and I would say that to me the main idea of energy humanities is that neither climate change nor the various economic and environmental challenges associated with fossil fuels are merely engineering problems or regulatory problems. They're, they are also narrative problems and ultimately problems of the imagination. My own particular expertise is in narrative, uh, by which I mean not just novels and short stories and things you might read on the beach, but also the implicit unspoken narratives that shape cultural imagining and everyday experience. In other words, how we think about or don't think about issues like oil and fossil fuels. Um, so narrative and the imagination are uh, central to the book that Dominic mentioned, um, Fueling Culture. Actually, I brought a copy, which is in my suitcase, and I don't want to take it home. So the first person who asked me for it, uh, it's, it's yours. I should say it's heavy. Uh, <laughs> so, so think, think first. Um, this is an interdisciplinary co collection of brief think pieces on, on the, it's kind of an A to Z of energy and culture. Uh, my usual stick is that we talk about addiction and Arctic, whaling, wood, and work. Uh, for this conference, the entries that are relevant are infrastructure, pipelines, risk, spill, and Texas. Um, one of the motivating ideas in this collection is that of impasse. Impasse. Uh, blockage, inability to proceed. And this is an idea from my uh, collaborator, Imra Zeman, who talks about the impasse of knowing where we stand with regard to energy, but being unable to take action adequate to the situation. And I'm mindful that in this room, we might have many different ideas of what the impasse is, right? So I want to acknowledge that. Um, but the book is intended to help think about and move beyond the impasse of the present which is a problem for politics, to be sure, but I would also say that impasse is connected to aesthetics. And by aesthetics, I mean uh, ideas and assumptions about what is beautiful, what is pleasurable, what is desirable. And in my scholarship and teaching about oil, these questions of pleasure and desire have only become more important because regardless of what one thinks about oil, every single one of us derives some kind of pleasure from the world that fossil fuels have built. And the word that energy humanities scholars, or just humanities scholars in general, use to describe this aspect of experience is embodiment. How our bodies interact with our, and are even shaped by the world around us. For some people, the sense of embodied petro pleasure comes from things like the smoothness and sheen of plastic. For me, it was the smell of my dad's butane lighter when I was a kid. And I've even written an essay about how I love to fly. Um, of course, it's not the indignities of post 9-11 commercial air travel that I love, but rather the thrill of acceleration when a pilot hits the gas and my body is jolted back into the seat. I love the technological sublime of an active airfield. For those of you of a certain age, it's a kind of Richard Scarry thing, a children's book, um, yeah, some nods, yeah. Um, uh, the many kinds of labor that bring a plane from the sky to the gate and the sea of twinkling blue lights on an airport runway at night. And I first described my love of flying for the students in my class on literature and oil. I asked the students to write an oil inventory uh, which is a creative open-ended assignment in which they made an inventory like a store might or a kind of list accounting and narrative of the significance and presence of oil in their lives and some uh, describe their relationship to oil over the course of a single day so I wake up you know da -da -da, oil throughout the day go to bed some wrote a biography of their oil lives so far and I realized actually that the man I sat down next to this morning was starting to tell me his biography mediated through pipelines and oil 
Um, I actually have a version of my academic biography that's traced through oil. I'm not going to read it to you, but um, uh, but I wrote this. This is this is not how academics usually tell their biography, right? Certainly, we tell like what colleges and universities we went to, but not what modes of transport we used, right? So th this is uh, this is an unusual biography, and I wrote this in response to a challenge from Stephanie Lemonager, who Dominic mentioned. Uh, wrote that beautiful book about oil and the American 20th century, uh, Living Oil is the title of it. And for a long time I couldn't remember whether the title of this book was Living Oil or Loving Oil because Stephanie is so interested in these deep embodied attachments, not so much to oil itself, which is like sticky and smelly, um, but to all the things that oil makes possible. And that's what I'm trying to get at uh, with my students in the oil inventory. Acknowledging the ways that they love some part of the world that oil has made, something they would not want to lose in the face of uh, transition, rather than focusing only on guilt, shame, or fear, which don't seem to me to be a promising way to break through impasse. Such negative emotions can lead to a gesture that th feels all too easy, uh, pointing out energy hypocrisy, whether one's own or that of others, as if anyone who drives or flies or eats Kellogg's cornflakes made with fertilizers, industrial food, forfeits the right to wonder and worry about fossil fuels. So we are oil subjects who inhabit an oil society. That's the big picture that the oil inventory invites students to glimpse. And in terms of aesthetics, which we might also describe as a way of seeing, how we learn to see or not to see, to regard some things as beautiful and some as ugly, the oil inventory invites students to recognize that one of the primary ways of seeing oil is actually not seeing it, taking it for granted, which is another aspect of impasse. So this is the image that we use for the cover of Feeling Culture. I think it's really uh, stunning, uh, gorgeous even. And there's an image credit there for the artist Mishka Henner. But he didn't exactly create this image. It's, it's more like he curated it. He, um, he found it. He searches Google Earth to find kind of striking images, and then he circulates them. So I'm interested in, in Mishka Henner's way of looking at the way that satellites look at the Earth, which I think is both an aesthetic and a political act. The beauty of this image has to do with scale and point of view and abstraction. The contrasting colors and delicate shapes come into view only from an extreme distance, the view from space. To be close up on the ground or in the water, embedded, uh, embedded and embodied within this place would probably not be so lovely. And those unlovely aspects are not visible in this image. So in other words, what and how you see depend on where you stand. And the default stance of not seeing oil amounts to what I call a quarantine of the imagination, which cordons off all those things that we've learned not to see, hear, smell, or think about. So a quarantine imagination is unable to think beyond the status quo or beyond our own experience, beyond the chain of ease, which is a phrase that I borrow from the poet Agago Ofoado, who writes of uh, petrol and paraffin piped away from rutting dugouts and thatched huts to float ships and fly planes to feed factories in the chain of ease. And it's a really suggestive metaphor, the chain of ease, that expresses both the freedom and constraint in fossil fuel modernity. The chain of ease is all the wonderful things uh, that, about oil that make our world go. The chain of ease is the sense of dependence, uh, built environments that require cars, uh, being, this is an electricity example, but being tethered to the grid. And the poet Agaga Foto is from the Niger Delta, uh, which is a site of oil extraction that has become notorious, synonymous with violence and pollution. It is perhaps the epitome of everything that can go wrong. And I should say that my examples in the rest of this talk are drawn from the Niger Delta, which is admittedly a rather different regulatory and political context from North America, but it's the one that I know best as a scholar of African literature. Um, and I'm trying to draw out some insights here that are relevant to our context. Um, I used these Niger Delta photographs by Ed Kashi as a quick visual shorthand for Afoto's poems about the Niger Delta. 
Um, he has a long poem about a tragic event that happened in October 1998 when ga uh, villagers had gathered at the site of a leaking pipe manifold and in the midst of fuel scarcity some couldn't resist the opportunity to collect uh, petrol for household use. The oil ignited and approximately a thousand people died in the, in the fire. And Ophoda's poem offers several incompatible stories of how this fire might have started. But what he's most interested in in the poem is understanding, as he says here, this was how the damage was done. How was the damage done? And he's interested in enumerating all the reasons, all the causes, all the factors together that led to the fire, not just the fire itself. These reasons include poverty, local fuel shortage, villagers' disregard of risk, corporate neglect in the face of leaking pipelines and corroded metal, political corruption, and lack of accountability. All of this was how the damage was done. And poems like a photos and photos like Kashi's offer an extreme version of what it's like to live with pipelines. And I use this poem as an example of the ways that literature and cultural imagining more broadly take a wilder, wider approach to questions of risk, harm, and responsibility than I'm guessing is common or even practical in the industry. In the mid-1980s, the German sociologist Ulrich Beck wrote about risk society in the wake of industrial disasters at Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Bhopal. Beck argued that modern industrial society had entered, entered a new phase where instead of distributing wealth, uh, capitalism and modern industry were now distributing risks and hazards. And what's most interesting to me about his argument is that he's concerned with questions of perception and imagination as much as with probability. In other words, how we uh, perceive, see, know, and imagine risk. And I turn to writers like a photo in order to understand how ordinary citizens understand risk in ways that may not add up in actuarial terms, or they add up only according to a kind of fuzzy math that weighs gut feelings, feelings of health and well-being, privacy and safety in one's home, attachments to family homesteads and fishing holes, even ancestral burial grounds. So this fuzzy mask, math, uh, imagining risk on the ground, weighs all of these feelings more heavily than any calculation of mathematical probability or financial exposure. I should explain this image, uh, which is of a woman in the Niger Delta using the, uh, a natural gas uh, flare to dry tapioca. And uh, this is a kind of interesting act of adaptation and, and living with, uh, with extraction. Um, and, and there are all kinds of ways of, of thinking about what uh, risk in, in this photograph. So what I'm saying is that the, these kinds of imaginings of risk are about how might the damage be done and in how many ways, how many unquantifiable ways would that damage be felt. Um, I'm going to kind of skip through uh, some slides here that are about uh, something I've noticed in my reading of, of literature about oil, which is the way that images of oil, when people write about oil, those images are so closely uh, associated with images of water. Um, so oil and water, we can think about the relationships between them. But there's also a close association uh, between uh, water, money, oil, and also blood and oil, as you know. And I think that one of the reasons why these images are so closely related, I'm giving you these visual images as a kind of shorthand for all the homework that I didn't ask you to do in, in reading the literature. Um, but I think that there's a kind of poetic or insight about their connections in the real world, how closely they, uh, they can be connected. Um, so in other words, uh, it tells us something about what's at stake in calculations of risk and probability. How the math matters depends on where you stand in relation to what is being counted or calculated. And it goes back, I think, to that question of aesthetics, how we learn to see and not to see, and from what vantage point. And think about um, these uh, optical illusions that switch between figure and ground. So I want you to think about what it is that you see in this image. Is your eye drawn to the black faces or to the white vase? And, and can you switch between them? And in these images, is your eye drawn to the people or the pipelines? And for those who live here, 
is represented in these images, what is figure and what is ground? And let me explain uh, just a little for those of you who aren't up on visual composition theory. Um, in aesthetic terms, ground is the part of an image that functions as context and remains static and inert. In other words, it's the background for the real dynamic object of interest that we call the figure. The figure is the thing that you're supposed to look at. And so we might say that everyone hopes that a pipeline can remain as ground, static and stable, not become the figure or the object of interest, the thing that happens. And as with Mishka Henner's work with satellite imagery, turning it into a kind of art, my point about figure and ground has something to do with scale and where you stand. How different are these images of pipelines from these ones, which show the infrastructure of pipelines and export terminals in the Niger Delta. The pipeline is not to be measured in X number of miles between a drill site and an export terminal along which something might go wrong, but hopefully won't. Instead, for those who live here along this particular section of pipeline, this might as well be their entire world. And remember that for a photo, it's the pipeline that joins the site of extraction with the chain of ease. That's one version of a community traced by a pipeline, following the pipeline, not following the money, but following the pipeline from extraction to consumption. But I think we can also think about a different kind of map of a different kind of territory, not of counties or provinces, states or countries, but instead of linear communities joined by life along pipelines. I think maybe this is something Jeff has some experience with. Imagining community in this way is, I think, another way of breaking through impasse. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to our three speakers. And I know that um, hors d'oeuvres and cocktails are calling. Um, but we do have a few minutes for some questions, if people have any. So, shoot. Yeah. I'd like to throw my name in for her book. <laughs> we have a winner. Okay. See where you work. I wanted to ask. I I really like this concept. I I, I work in an organization that um, is highly technical. And we have a lot of engineers and scientists, and then we have a very small group of people that are um, educated in the liberal arts and humanities and are planner types. Um, and we're starting to be predominated in our management by by engineers. And I'm seeing a culture change. You know, how is this in the energy industry? And also, uh, I'm a biologist. My son's in school, getting a civil engineering degree. Um, how is the the response from the energy energy industry and that has really switched over to being an engineer dominated culture responding to to y'all and the message that you're uh, giving about that you need this kind of education um, in your organization. <laughs> And, and his assistant is an industry person. And what happens with the different industry people who are engineers, I guess maybe I could say engineers don't understand the idea of delving deep into a question. So his idea of education oftentimes is just you go to the seminar for five days and you absorb the information, whereas we have conflicts like we need to have them work through problems and we need to have multiple meetings over a semester to get the training in their head about thinking this way. It's not education just being thrown at you. And the other issue is the engineering programs do not allow enough room for electives, and neither do the business. So engineering and business are really tough. They will, it's hard to penetrate them. We have occasional students coming in through our advertising, and they tend to be from other nations who understand these problems, who've lived with them, like Iraqis, Iranians, Pakistanis. They understand their power dynamics around oil. But the American kids are pretty clueless, and that's part of why the work that energy humanities are doing is getting them to think about why we've spent an entire century not even thinking about it, whereas other people do. So the thing that I found is um, many are open to it, and but the problem is that um, in my
my university, they still. I'll just, I'll, I'll just add that um, I, I think that generally our experience at Rice has been there's a lot of curiosity, there's a lot of interest, but I think there's still often industries trying to figure out how to put those pieces together because it's kind of outside the box, literally. Um, but actually, I mean, when we first founded the Senate Rice, and now that was five years ago, it was in the context of the, you know the Brazilian short-lived Brazilian oil boom, uh, and there was real interest in thinking about how to bring humanities into those conversations, and partly because that's of the national dimension. But I think also just more generally, what I was hearing from people was an interest and in a recognition of the fact that community matters and context matters. And then it was just trying to figure out then what you know how do you develop that further into something that's that's helpful for for all parties. And, uh, sorry, I, I was at the University of Michigan uh, until 2014, and I started teaching my literature and oil course there. And I was delighted that after the first time that I taught it, um, the engineering school found it. And and University of Michigan in in, our, in Ann Arbor is very close, both geographically and institutionally, to Detroit and the the automobile industry. And so. The engineering school uh, made my course one of the humanities, the courses that uh, engineers could take to check off their humanities requirement, which was just wonderful. And I kind of, you know, did with those uh, first year uh, engineering students in my class, kind of what I, some of what I did today, just in terms of giving them very basic aesthetic and narrative principles, right? So there are multiple points of view in a narrative and what happens when you, when you put those points of view together. And I loved having those students because they were so serious and so um, eager and also w were so committed to connecting the dots between the kinds of things that I and, and ways of thinking that, that I was offering them and, and the professions that they were committed to going into. So that's not exactly kind of how industry responds, but it's an opportunity to, um, to engage with, with people who, who will be industry eventually. Thanks for the question. Yeah, and, and uh, Glenn has one in the back, Beth. After Go ahead, Jeff. Real quickly, while they're going back there, is the real tell is: Are they hiring your students as interns and and taking bringing people that are not engineers but you know have humanities degrees into your into those organizations? Well, to be honest, at my university, the oil uh, we have an energy advisory. So their complaints have been the students are not creative enough. And the natural tendency for our leaders is to think we're not good enough of a school because we're the University of Houston. You know what I mean? Like they take it and put it on themselves. Like we need to improve rather than thinking outside the box. Like, well, maybe they need to go and take some humanities stuff. So I'm on this kind of push to um, have them do that. But I have studied and observed this. I know many women in Houston who are in their 60s and 70s who were landmen. And they were trained in the liberal arts. And that was a venue for women to get into the oil industry when there wasn't a lot of place. And they had those, I hate to be gender stereotypical, but they had those skills of social interaction through their liberal arts and through gender. I mean, that's another issue of gender in the industry as well. And 
So when you look at it and we break it down, you will probably find that there's a lot of people who are dealing with community relations who have these kind of backgrounds because they're naturally drawn to this kind of um, this kind of uh, intellectual enterprise. But I think um, I know with oil industry, I'm not seeing a real push, but I am hearing that saying they need more creativity. So this whole making the connection between the different being interdisciplinary is what we're working to promote. Glenn. In this room is most of the members of the Pipeline Safety Trust. Uh, I'm on the board of the trust. Um, and all of us have a story of how we came to be members of the trust. Most of it was born of some very bad days. And of course, the trust was born from a great tragedy. One of the very hard lessons has been that there is no way to fund what we are. We are um, the poor side of the oil and gas industry. And so we have a great story to tell. We have great people, yet we have no way to continuously and adequately fund what we have to say. And that seems to be typical across America. Anyone who says anything cross with the oil and gas industry in most of our government ends up on the bad side of the deal financially. How, how are we going to correct that? How is that? I mean, we, we, we're not here to oppose oil and gas. We're here to educate people about how it works. But we've never figured out how to fund that. And I thought maybe some of you have some thoughts of that. I guess, yeah, I guess, <laughs> I guess I've been nominated to, 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 try, to try to field that one. Um, I, get, I mean, I get it. I think it's the same. You know, uh, Houston's got what, 5,000 energy companies in it. 90% of them are oil and gas related in some way or another. It's very easy to, to raise funding for something, you know, like our Baker Institute at Rice, which is, uh, you know, very, very closely connected to a lot of oil majors, much harder for uh, an outfit like ours that also tries to do work on renewables. So I think it's the same. I, I see the same dynamics there at the same time. But one thing I think that is in encouraging is that you have a really important mission here and, and maybe part of it is just you know getting until I met Jeff I wasn't really aware of BSD I'm going to be honest of my ignorance uh, and I think there are people out there who would support if they were more aware of the good work you're doing and so maybe part of that is to again you know take some of the advice I heard in the in the previous panel and maybe think about you know getting in getting your own communicational outreach reshaped for the social media era kickstarters and things like these are all new tools for crowdsourcing through small donations from concerned concerned folks um, but often, you know, projects that are difficult to fund through major donations from oil and gas industry, I think would have a would have a natural audience you know, through other media. I would say critical to the efforts would be getting. It may not have gotten bad enough in the U.S. where oil and gas people companies are feeling the heat enough. But um, when the conflicts get to be more, they're probably going to be willing to put into a fund. And this is how it happened with the international oil industry. With Extractive Indices, indices, extractive indices Transparency Index, which was started by Tony Blair. So because Shell had such crazy problems in Nigeria and were actually implicated in some of the violence around the killing of the activists that they didn't, they settled outside of court around that, Shell had to do all these reports, and I think this is important to recognize. This director of Nigeria, Shell, in 97 said, we've had 300 years of financial accounting, experience with financial accounting. We've had 30 years of experience with environmental accounting. We've had virtually zero experience with social accounting. And because of that, Shell has kind of been a leader, and they put original funds into this EITI group, and the group really make, it works to promote transparency and get rid of some of these problems around the oil curse in Africa. It's been effective, and it's industry funded. But it's considered, but these were things done under duress. But even with climate change, I think Shell has like, I mean, they really have come out. We have some of their people corporate social responsibility teach for our program and they just said we're going to come out ahead because they had they had Nigeria, they had Brinks Bar, and then they had Ireland. And they didn't even predict that stuff. And if you read articles about it, um, people said you should have had some social scientists in there. You know, the company is a bit disparate. It has different heads that need to be made, right? It doesn't have a central leadership. So, um, but this is where I think probably money would have to come in the end. This is through the pipeline companies realizing this is a big enough thing. And to not control it. I mean, I don't, we don't take money in our program from companies because it would implicate our, you know, it would make us see that we're kowtowing to them in some way. So that's a model to use for putting that together. I think the companies will probably be happy if it did some of the 
not become a big thing now with the company, but it has in Africa, so everyone's acting in some way around that fear of that, losing, losing profits because of a bad reputation. And I mean, this isn't about pipeline. Well, I guess it is actually about pipelines. Uh, the, I mean, what you're talking about is social license to operate, and I, and I think that that license is increasingly um, being questioned, perhaps, I think certainly not uh, not at the level of, uh, of the federal administration at this moment, but uh, you know, if you think about the mobilization around uh, Keystone XL pipeline, and particularly around Standing Rock, where with the, the kinds of solidarities that were formed there, not only among indigenous peoples, but with veterans and environmentalists, um, there is a, a sense of, uh, you know, people are asking questions. And so so I, I hear you about, you know, um, being shut down in terms of who really has the money. But I think that there is a, a broader, um, there, there's something broader happening than merely um, in the industry and the government. Um, I would also observe that uh, in North America, well, in North America and in the U.S., Hey, the places where the most exciting energy, organized energy humanities work is happening are Houston, Alberta, Scotland. <laughs> so that tells you that, that this conversation tends to gather around those major sites in the industry. Uh, so uh, how to, <laughs> how to um, capitalize on that, I'm not exactly sure. And, and then the last thing I would say is, um, as a humanities person, actually it's talking about things like energy and environment that that allows us to fight our own battles within the the university because <laughs> we it, the humanities are not the people <laughs> in the university with the money right so so talking about these things gives us access or or you know it, it allows administrators to think about the relevance of our work in a way that they perhaps had not been accustomed to and if I may just take the chair's prerogative to add one thing to that, I mean, I think that one of the reasons that the energy humanities has risen up in these places is because, you know, these conversations, when it's right there in your backyard, and these conversations about energy and the energy future are happening, but they're happening in terms of, you know, legalities and regulations and, uh, you know, technical questions and humanity scholars who are observing this thing. But, but wait, these are, these are historical questions. These are cultural questions. These are, you know, aesthetic questions. Um, and that, yeah, so... They're your neighbors, and you have breakfast, and you have barbecues, and all. I mean, really, I was shocked. I was like, "Wow, these are normal people who live next door." To me. <laughs> and there was an oil demand in Africa in the '90s, and they were asking me more about Africa than anybody else in my regular life. Like, why does this guy need a red carpet when we get him off the plane? And why is everybody poor? You know, it, it was like thrilling. So, I mean, that's also why you see the humanity. It's easy outside of these areas to demonize the industry because no one interacts. It's a real problem. It's called an enclave. So you're not able to actually learn from the people in the industry if you're not in one of these locations because of that defensive wall. Alexis, you want to squeeze one in? Go ahead. Out there in that starting in Iraq about what happens and now we're just experiencing we're coming to it late in the US.
Thank you, everyone. Um, I, the reception is in the same room as lunch. Um, there are drinks, there are hors d'oeuvres. Um, please join us. And maybe one last round of applause for the wonderful team. <laughs>